Welcome to another Human Red Audiobook by the United Marxist Pact Discord server, link below in the description. In this series, we continue our investigation into the initial construction, the organizational structure, and the principles and tactics of the form of worker organization capable of seizing political power and establishing the revolutionary proletarian dictatorship and communality, which can in turn produce a communist mode of production through the shared class interests of the workers of the entire world. Our goal is to compile, analyze, and elaborate on what all these texts have to say about this, and at the end have a strong understanding of the exact scientific process of this, particularly in general terms. At the end of our readings as a whole, we will try to put it all together and present it as a coherent whole in an educational video with associated notations. Today's reading will be on Gorder's open letter to Comrade Lenin in 1921. We have a pre-written textual analysis on the terms of the aforementioned topics, which is also posted in the pinned comment if you prefer to read it in text, or follow the link in the description to a read-only version of my Google Docs notes. This will summarize the contents of the text, but is no replacement for the actual reading itself for the sake of understanding the context. In addition, in the reading, I supply my own commentary, critiques, additions, etc., which may be helpful for understanding some particularities. So, going through this, in this text, in terms of worker organizations, construction, structure, principles, and tactics, Hermann Gorder critiques Lenin's left communism and infantile disorder, along with the determinations of the Third International on groups of what he perceives as opportunism due to the inapplicable conditions of the Russian Revolution being applied to the conditions of Western Europe, where capital is much more powerful. Gorder calls for the positioning of the ideological development of the masses and of class consciousness to be centralized, rather than the role of leadership, explaining that leadership arises out of strong mass organizations, ones that are pure of character, which is achieved through internal struggle, centralization, and discipline. Ultimately, the leader should form one united whole with the class, the mass, and the party in turn, the economic weapons of the mass, which must be proletarian character, industrial worker organizations. However, because of this, the role of leadership is less and the mass is greater, as the leadership is not external to the mass. His position is that tactics should in general be based on the general tendency of conditions at any stage of the revolution, and thereby be dynamic. However, across the board, because the proletariat cannot rely on any other class, its tactics must be ones which raise the consciousness of the masses and individuals, who are to be educated through practices to be revolutionary fighters, to understand their responsibilities, and whose responsibilities rest on them and them alone. In terms of organizations which can bring about this understanding, industrial unions, workshop organizations, and workers' unions are good weapons for this, as it teaches the workers to act for themselves by controlling their leadership and supervising the entire organization. This is because every individual needs to be able to play an active role within an organization that is centralized. But within that centralization, it is open to action of these individuals. The foundation of the worker councils is a rank-and-file movement within factories and workshops, and there, parliamentary democracy does not take place, but rather all take action. Because truly revolutionary communists will necessarily separate themselves from social patriots any attempts to organize them with them will only lead to the weakening of the party. We cannot ally with bourgeois unions, parliamentary forces, etc. This ceases the development of the revolutionary class consciousness. The masses must be able to understand the social construction ahead, take and accept difficult decisions, and be roused by one creative impulse, the creation of a class dictatorship, which will in turn produce communism. This cannot be done without a vanguard to bring the masses to consciousness of its responsibilities, which requires that it, be, that it carry out pure action, propaganda, internal organization that matches this. The workers must learn this and must not fall into leader politics, where they can shove off duty of action to some mythical leader or external forces. The liberation of the workers must be the work of the workers alone. The clever tactics of leaders will not carry the revolution. Leaders should be left to act, but their role cannot be the basis of the class party, which must train the workers to act as a class to take action for and by themselves, which should cause them to coalesce into one mass. 
Ultimately, the question is if a tactic strengthens the spirit of the workers in terms of class consciousness, liberating them from the state of ideological apparatuses, from the state ideological apparatuses, while also attacking imperialism, that's to say landowners, industrial magnates, and merchant banking capital, which unifies all capitals and petite bourgeois into one mass. Our propaganda carried out in meetings, the press, through example, in slogans, and actions on the shop floor, therefore, must be aimed at the working class and pay bourgeois elements with the expectation that we will only receive a small fraction of the latter, but the rest will ally with capital against the revolution. As pay bourgeois enter into the struggle, the party must have programs and tactics to expel those elements. Not, not the people, but expel the pay bourgeois ideology that comes via those people. Continuing. This also means that engagement in electoralism is counterproductive. Any quote unquote wins gained through are actually losses, as it harms the ideological development of the masses. The proletariat must be made independently revolutionary. To this end, any engagement with other working or worker organizations should not be done in the electoral sphere or on the ground in all struggles. It is here that the masses will be prepared in terms of will and deed, and a proletariat is produced as capable of fighting the unity of the bourgeoisie bought by imperialism, banking capital. A proletariat that is fully conscious, communist, and determined with unity. Due to the differing role of the party rather than the class dictatorship being a party dictatorship, instead, is a true class dictatorship which a party must prepare the working class to achieve. To this end, the party must have revolutionaries that are 1. politically conscious, 2. convicted, 3. ready for any deed necessary, and 4. any sacrifice necessary. And any elements are hesitant to any and all of these must be attenuated by the party's program, action, and tactics. This is necessary because it is the only way that the party can produce a class that is truly revolutionary and communist, which requires propaganda, slogans, and the party taking lead in action, being purely revolutionary and communist itself. It is through such a character that the kind of leaders necessary will arise, wherein the program and tactic expel all uncertain and opportunist elements. Such a party will inspire the entire class with that creative impulse of communist spirit, revolution, and class dictatorship. Through correct action, the party, class, economic organizations, and leadership become one whole. This, however, is not immediate. Because economic organizations focus on these victories, they are necessarily reformist and ultimately tools. To this end, the bourgeois economic organs must be destroyed, as this result is inevitable. Only proletarian organs can remain. This is the communist industrial worker organization. Through centralization and discipline, however, which suborns the leadership to the class, all are brought into one whole as a revolution development. In short, Gorder says that the left wing will create tactics for its own conditions, which, due to imperialism uniting all other classes against the revolution, will respond to this organizational power, recognize the power of banking capital, and focus on the masses. To this end, they will not ally with other classes, produce propaganda aimed at liberating the spirit of the proletariat from bourgeois ideology, destroy bourgeois trade unions in favor of, we of other weapons of the proletariat, abandon parliamentarism which confuses the proletariat, focus on the down-up, bring the masses around the party only if they are converted to fu be fully communists, and reduce the rule role of leaders. Ultimately, the tactic the question is if a tactic strengthened the spirit to and that is our pre-written notes on the reading i will now begin the full audit book reading and i hope you enjoy the session we'll attend next time as well all right welcome back to another reading of united marxist pact we are continuing our investigation on worker organization. We took a little bit of a tour back in the past in order to kind of get some understanding of organizational structure. We didn't really get that much out of it, but there are some interesting things brought up. 
This time we are continuing um, where we had left off before at the end of the democratic principle. This one on Gorder's open letter to Comrade Lin in, in 1921. This was a reply to left-wing communism and infantile disorder, wherein Lenin criticized uh, the German and Dutch variants of left communism and, and didn't so much the uh, Italian left communist movement um, in terms of their adherence to spontaneity, their refusal to engage in parliament despite having it as an option, and a couple of other things I can't remember off the top of my head. I could tell you if I actually remembered. But I'm sure that this text will actually discuss his criticism. So, let's get straight into it. I wish to draw your attention, Comrade Lennon, and that of the reader, to the fact that this letter was written at the time of the triumphant march of the Russians to Warsaw. I likewise request you and the reader to excuse their frequent repetitions. They were unavoidable owing to the fact that the tactics of the, quote, lefts are still unknown to the workers of most countries. Herman Gorder. So in the contents, we have the question of trade unions. That's one. Uh, parliamentarism, opportunism, and the third international, and conclusion. And of course, notes. But um, yeah. Introduction. Dear Comrade Lenin, I have read your brochure on the radicalism in the communist movement. It has taught me a great deal, as all your writings have done. For this, I feel grateful for you, and doubtless many other comrades feel as I do. Many a trace and many a germ of this infantile disease, to which, a, without a doubt, I am also a victim, has been chased away by your brochure, or will yet be eradicated by it. Your observations about the confusion that revolution has caused in many brains is quite right, too. I know that. The revolution came so suddenly, and in such a way so utterly different from what we expected. Your words will be incentive to me once again, and to even greater extent than before, to base my judgment in all matters of tactics, also in the revolution, and exclusively on reality, on the actual class relations as they manifest themselves politically and economically. After reading your brochure, I thought all this is right. But after con having considered for a long time whether I would cease to uphold this, quote, left wing, and to write articles for the KAPD and the opposition party in England, I had to decline. Basis mistaken. This seems contradictory. It is due, though, to the fact that the starting point in the brochure is not right. To my idea, you are mistaken in your judgments regarding the analogy of the Western European Revolution with the Russian one, regarding the conditions of the Western European Revolution, that is to say, the class relations. And this leads you to mistake the cause from which this left wing, the opposition, originates. Therefore, the brochure seems to be right, as long as your starting point is assumed. If, however, as it should be, your starting point is rejected, the entire brochure is wrong as all your mistakes and partly mistaken judgments converge in your condemnation of the left movement, especially in Germany and England, and I firmly intend to defend those of the left wing, although, as the leaders know, I do not agree with them on all points. I imagine I had best answer your brochure by defense of the left wing. This will enable me not only to point out its origin, the cause from which it springs, and to prove its rights and merits in the present stage and here in Western Europe, but also, which is of equal importance, to combat the mistaken conceptions that are prevalent in Russia with regard to the West European Revolution. Both of these points are of importance, as it is on the conception of the West European Revolution that the West European as well as the Russian tactics depend. I should have liked to do this at the Moscow Congress, which, however, I was not able to attend. Two arguments refuted. In the first place, I must refute two of your arguments that may mislead the judgment of comrades or readers. You scoff and sneer at the ridiculous and childish nonsense of the struggle in Germany, at the, quote, dictatorship of the leaders or of the masses, end quote, or at, quote, from above or below, etc. We quite agree with you that these should be no questions at all, but we do not agree with your scoffing, for that is the pity of it. 
in Western Europe, there are still questions. In Western Europe, we still have, in many countries, leaders of the type of the Second International. Here we are still seeking the right leaders, those who do not try to dominate the masses, that do not betray them. And as long as we do not find these leaders, we want to do all things from below and through the dictatorship of the masses themselves. If I have a mountain guide and he should lead me into the abyss, I prefer to do without him. As soon as we have found the right guides, we will stop this searching. Then the mass and leader will really be one. This and nothing else is what the German and English left wing, and what we ourselves mean by these words. And the same holds good for your second remark, that the leader should form one united whole with class and mass. Um, ideally, this leader isn't like one guy. I'm, I'm just going to say that. <laughs> right? I understand the drive to kind of associate the revolution with one person, but this, this is a great man theory type stuff. Yes, it's important for men like Lin men and women and non-binary people to rise up like Lenin and, and, and Mao and so on and so forth and perhaps be the face of the revolution be able to cut through things but realistically you know this could be also handled by a secretive private central organ that is faceless but still takes in information and and stuff like that not not like a blankest type thing <laughs> um but you know what i mean I don't think that rests on an individual whether or not a revolutionary movement can go forward, or at least it shouldn't. If if we are relying on such an individual, then I think that we're kind of doing things wrong. Uh, you know, in, in a business, you can swap out your um, CEO with no problems. <laughs> I mean, it can, it can be harmful if you if you get a wrong person who actually wants to make changes, but that's that's really what happens. The less a CEO makes changes after coming into position, the more productive the company is. <laughs> Unless, th though they should start making changes after like two or three years, if I remember correctly, the, the statistics there. You got a division of labor, which is something that centralized uh, organizations should have of this character. You got a division of labor, then your leadership should be able to be swapped out. They should be cogs in the machine like everybody else. Um, anyway, uh, continuing. We quite agree. And the same holds good for your second remark, that the leader should form one united mass with the whole class and mass. We quite agree with you, but the question is to find and rear leaders that are really one with the masses. This can only be accomplished by the masses, the political parties, and the trade unions by means of the most severe struggle, also inwardly. And the same holds good for iron discipline and strong centralization. We want them all right, but not until we have the right leaders. This severe of all struggles, which is now being fought most strenuously in Germany and England, the two countries where communism is near to its realization, can only be harmed by your scoffing. Your attitude panders to the opportunist elements in the Third International. By this scoffing, you abet the opportunist elements in the Third International. Okay, let's see. See, we're going to take this as our first quotation. All right. For it is one of the means by which elements in the Spartacus League and the BSP, and also in the communist parties in many other countries, imposes upon the workers when they say that the entire question of masses and leader is absurd, is, quote, nonsense and childishness, end quote. Through this phrase they avoid, and wish to avoid, all criticism of themselves, the leaders. It is by means of this phrase of an iron discipline and centralism that they crush the opposition, and this opportunism is abetted by you. You should not do this, comrade. We are only in the introductory stage yet. 
here in Western Europe. And in that stage, it is better to encourage the fighters and the rulers. I only touch on this quite perfunctorily here. In the course of this writing, I will deal with this matter more at length. There is a deeper reason why I yet, why I yet, why I can't agree with your brochure sure, is the following. Uh, as an aside, I want to be clear that I'm not dismissing leaders, a general uh, leaders, a general military command. The need and value of these people cannot be discounted. However, if we are sitting here waiting for the right guy to come in and suddenly all of our preparation becomes possible, then we're kind of barking up the wrong tree and we need to reorganize and look at how we're organizing and how we're structuring. Leadership is important. A particular leader should not be. Okay, continue. Difference between Russia and Western Europe. On reading your pamphlets, brochures, and books, nearly all of which writings filled us with admiration and approbation, we Marxists of Western Europe invariably come to po came to a point where we suddenly grew wary. On the lookout for a more detailed explanation, and if we fi fail to find this explanation, we accepted the statements begrudgingly and with due reservations. This is your statement regarding the workers and the poor peasants. It occurs often, very often, excuse me, and you always mention both of these categories as revolutionary factors all over the world. And nowhere, at least as far as I've read, is there a clear and outspoken recognition of the immense difference which prevails in the matter between Russia and a few other countries in Eastern Europe and Western Europe. That is to say, Germany, France, England, Belgium, Holland, Switzerland, and the other Scandinavian countries, and perhaps even Italy. And yet, in my opinion, the fundamental difference between your conception of tactics concerning trade unionism and parliamentarism, and that of your so-called left wing in Europe, lies mainly in this point. Of course you know this difference as well as I do. Only you fail to draw from conclusions for the tactics of Western Europe at least as far as I am able to judge from your works. These conclusions you have not taken into consideration, and consequently, your judgment on the West European tactics is false. Footnote. In Sane Revolution, for instance, you write, page 67, quote, The greatest majority of the peasantry in every capitalist country that has any peasantry at all is oppressed by the government, and so thirsting for the latter's overthrow for, quote, cheap government. The proletariat is called upon to carry this into execution. End quote. The trouble is, however, that the peasantry does not thirst for communism. Okay. Um, so, back to the text. And this is all the more dangerous, because this phrase of yours is parroted automatically in all the communist parties in Western Europe, even by Marxists. To judge from all communist papers, magazines, and brochures, and from all public assemblies, one might even surmise that a revolt of the poor peasants in Western Europe might break out at any moment. Nowhere is the great difference with Russia pointed out, and thus the judgment, also the poor old Terry, is led astray. Because in Russia you were able to triumph with the help of a large class of poor peasants, you represent things in such a way, as if we in Western Europe are also going to have that help. Because you and Russia have triumphed exclusively through this help, you wish to make us believe that here also we will triumph through this help. You do this by means of your silence with regard to this question, as it stands in Western Europe. Your entire tactics are based on this representation. Continuing. Poor peasant, decisive factor. This representation, however, is not the truth. There is an enormous difference between Russia and Western Europe. In general, the importance of the poor peasants as a revolutionary factor decreases from east to west. In some parts of Asia, China, and India, in the event of a revolution, this class would absolutely be the decisive factor. In Russia, it constitutes an indispensable and, indeed, one of the main factors. In Poland and a few states of southeastern and central Europe, it is still of importance for the revolution. But further west, its attitude grows ever more antagonistic towards the revolution. Russia had an industrial proletariat of some seven or eight millions. 
The number of poor peasants, however, amounted to about 25 million. I beg of you to excuse the inevitable numerical errors. I have to quote from memory, as this letter should be dispatched with all speed. When Kerensky failed to give these poor peasants the soil, you knew that before long they would come to you, the minute that they should become aware of the fact. This is not so in Western Europe, and it will not become so either. In the countries of Western Europe, which I have named, the conditions of that sort do not exist. The poor peasant lives here under conditions quite different from those in Russia. Though often terrible, they are not as appalling as they were there. As farmers or owners, the poor peasants possess a piece of land. The excellent means of transport enables them to often sell their goods. At the very worst, they can mostly provide their own food. During the last 10 years, things have improved somewhat for them. Now, during and since the war, they can obtain high prices. They are indispensable, the import of foodstuffs being limited. Regularly, therefore, they will be able to get high prices. They are supported by capitalism. Capitalism will maintain them so long as it can maintain itself. Uh, that didn't end up being the case, but okay. In your country, the position of poor peasants was far more terrible. With you, therefore, the poor peasants had a political revolutionary program and were organized in a political revolutionary party with the social revolutionaries. With us, this is nowhere the case. Moreover, in Russia, there was an enormous amount of landed property to be divided, large estates, crown lands, government land, and the estates held by the monasteries. But the communists of Western Europe, what can they offer to the poor pe peasants to win them over to their side? Nothing to offer peasants. Germany counted, before the war, from 4 to 5 million poor peasants, up to 2 hectares. Only 8 or 9 million, however, were employed in actual large-scale industries, over 100 hectares. If the communists were to divide all these, uh, the poor peasants would still be poor peasants, as the 7 or 8 million field laborers also claim their share, and they cannot even divide them, as they will use them as large-scale industries. Uh, and we have a footnote here. The agrarian thesis of Moscow acknowledges this. Back to the text. These numbers show that in Western Europe there are comparatively few poor peasants, that therefore the auxiliary forces, if there were any at all, would be very few in numbers. The communists in Germany, therefore, except in relatively insignificant regions, do not even have the means to win over the poor peasants. For the medium and small industries, they sh will surely not be expropriated. It is practically the same in the case of the 4 to 5 million poor peasants in France, and also for Switzerland, Belgium, Holland, and two of the Scandinavian countries. Footnote. I have no statistical data for Sweden and Spain. Everywhere small and medium-sized industry prevails, and even in Italy there is no absolute certainty not to mention England, which counts only some or or two some one or two hundred thousand peasants. Neither will they be attracted by the promise that under communism they will be exempt from rent paying and mortgage rent, for with communism they see approaches civil war, the loss of markets, and general destruction. And let's therefore they should come to a crisis far more terrible than any present one in Germany. A crisis, indeed, far exceeding the horrors of any other crisis that ever were before. The poor peasants in Western Europe will side with capitalism, as long as it has any life left. Footnote. In the brochure The World Revolution, I have emphatically pointed out this difference between Russia and Western Europe. The development of the German Revolution has proved that any judgment was even too optimistic. In Italy, it is possible that the poor peasants will side with the proletariat. Uh, so, yeah, and, you know, by the time, the, the Great Depression was not. Um, so, you know, I think that the peasants were, in fact, galvanized. Actually, I think the Great Depression was already going on. And in addition, of course, World War II came, but I think by the time World War II came, the Peasantry within Western Europe probably didn't really exist. So, um, yeah. Continuing. Industrial workers stand alone. The workers in Western Europe stand all alone. 
only a very slight portion of the lower middle class will help them. These are economically insignificant. The rep workers will have to make the revolution all by themselves. Here's a great difference as compared to Russia. Possibly, you will say, Comrade Lenin, that this is the case. Oh, excuse me. That this is the case in Russia. There also the proletariat has made the revolution all by itself. It is only after the revolution that the poor peasants joined. You are right, and yet the difference is immense. You knew with absolute certainty that the peasants would come to you, and that they would come quickly. You knew that Kerensky would not, and could not give them the land. You knew that they would not help Kerensky long. You had a magic charm, quote, the land to the peasants, by mean to of which you would win them in the course of a few months to the side of the proletariat. We, on the other hand, are certain that for some time to, to some the poor presence all over Western Europe will side with capitalism. You will possibly say that, although in Germany there is no great mass of poor peasants whose assistance can be relied on, the millions of proletarians that side as yet with the bourgeoisie are sure to come round, that therefore the place of the poor peasants in Russia will here be taken by the proletarians, so that there is help out all the same. This representation is also fundamentally wrong, and the immense difference remains. The poor peasants joined the proletariat after capitalism had been defeated. But when the German workers, that are now as yet on the side of capitalism, join the ranks of the communists, the struggle against capitalism will begin in real earnest. The revolution in Russia was terrible for the proletariat in the long years of its development, and it's terrible now, after the victory. But the actual time of revolution, it was easy, and this was due to the peasants. With us, it's quite the contrary. In its development, the revolution was easy, and it will be easy afterward. But its actual coming will be terrible, more terrible perhaps than any other revolution ever was, for capitalism, which in your country was weak and only slightly rooted, as it were, to feudalism, the Middle Ages, and even barbarism. Here in our country is strong and widely can organized and deeply rooted, and the lower middle classes as well as the peasants, who always side with the strongest, with the exception of a shallow and economically unimportant la layer which will stand with capitalism until the very end. The revolution in Russia was victorious with the help of the poor peasants. This should always be borne in mind here in Western Europe and all of the world over. But the workers in Western Europe stand alone. It should never be forgotten in Russia. The proletariat in Western Europe stands alone. This is the absolute truth, and on this truth our tactics must be based. All tactics that are not based on this are false and lead the proletariat to terrible defeat. Practice has also proved that these assertions are true, for the poor peasants in Western Europe have not only no program and failed to claim the land, but they do not even stir now that communism is approaching. As I have observed before, this statement is not to be taken absolutely literally. There are regions in Western Europe where, as we have mentioned before, landed property on a large scale is predominant, where the peasants are therefore in favor of communism. There are yet other regions where the local conditions are such that the poor peasants may be one for communism, but these regions are rel comparatively small. Neither do I wish to imply that quite at the close of the revolution, when things are coming down, there will be no poor peasants coming to our side. They undoubtedly will. That is why we must carry on an unceasing propaganda amongst them. Our tactics, however, must be adopted for the beginning and the course of the revolution. What I mean is the general trend, the tendency of the general tendency of conditions, and it is on those alone that our tactics must be based. Footnote: uh, You, comrade, will surely not try and win an argument by taking the assertions of your opponent in too absolute a sense, as small minds do. My remark. My above remark, therefore, is meant for the latter. Uh, our tech. Okay, we're going to take this. And we're also going to say... Uh, this is not absolute. Editors note. That's probably not how you. Uh, it's it, it's ed, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. 
from this there follows in the first place, and it should be clearly, emphatically, and plainly stated that in Western Europe, the real revolution, that is to say the overthrow of capitalism and the erection of and permanent institution of communism, for the time being it's possible only in those countries where the proletariat by itself is strong enough against all the other classes, in Germany, England, and Italy, where the help of the poor peasants is not possible. In uh, the other countries, the revolution can be prepared as yet by means of propaganda, organization, and fighting. The revolution itself can only follow when the economic conditions will be thus shaken through the revolution in the big states, Russia, Germany, and England, that the bourgeois class will have grown sufficiently weak. For you will agree with me that we cannot base our tactics on events that may come, but that may also never happen from the Russian armies, rising in India, in India, terrible crises, etc., etc. That you should have failed to recognize this truth concerning the importance of the poor peasants, comrade, is your first great mistake, and likewise that of the executive in Moscow and the International Congress. What does it mean with regard to tactics? This fact that the proletariat of Western Europe stands all alone, that has no prospect of any help from whatsoever from any other class. It means, in the first place, that the demands made on the masses are far greater here than in Russia, that therefore the proletarian mass is of far greater importance in the revolution, in the second place that the importance of the leaders is proportionally smaller. For Russian masses, proletarians knew for certain, and already saw during the war, in part before their very eyes, that the peasants would soon be on their side. The German proletarians to take them first know that they will be opposed by German capitalism in its entirety with all its classes. And we're going to take this, especially for this last line. Right there. For the Russian masses to... Oh, sorry. Um, the German proletarians to take them first know that they will be opposed by German capitalism in its entirety with all its classes. It is true that already before the war, the German proletarians numbered from 19 to 20 million actual workers of a population of 70 million, but they stood alone against all the other classes. Footnote. Of course, I had to take the pre-war figures and have made the increase in proletarians after the last census of 1909 proportionate to that before. They are opposed by capitalism that is immeasurably stronger than that of Russia, and they are unarmed. The Russians were armed. From every German proletarian, therefore, from every individual, the revolution demands a far greater courage and spirit of sacrifice than was necessary in Russia. This was the outcome of the economic class relations in Germany, not some theory or idea risen from the brain of romantic revolutionaries or intellectuals. Unless the entire class, or at least the great majority, stand up for the revolution personally, with almost superhuman force, in opposition to all the other classes, the revolution will fail. For you will agree with me that on determining our tactics we should reckon with our own forces, not from those from outside, on Russian help, for instance. The proletariat, almost unarmed, alone, without help, against a closely united capitalism, means for Germany that every proletarian must be a conscious fighter, every proletarian a hero, and it is the same for all Western Europe. Okay, um... For the majority of the proletariat to turn into conscious, steadfast fighters into real communists, they must be greater, immeasurably greater, here than in Russia, in absolute as well as in relative sense. And once more, this is the outcome, not of representations, the dreams of some intellectual or poet, poet, but of the purest realities. Okay, we're going to take this. As the importance of the class grows, and the importance of leaders becomes relatively less, this does not mean that we must not have the very best leaders. The best are not good enough. We are trying hard to find them. It only means that the importance of leaders, as compared to that of the masses, is decreasing. For you who had to win a country of 160 million with the help of 7 or 8 million, the importance of leaders was certainly immense. To triumph over so many with so few, and is that the first place in matter of tactics. To do as you did, comrade, to win over such a huge land with such small forces, but with assistance from outside, all depends in the first place on the tactics of the leader.
when you, Comrade Lennon, started to struggle with a small gathering of proletarians. It was in the first place your tactics in the crucial moments that waged a battle and won the poor peasants. But what about Germany? There, the cleverest tactics, the greatest clarity, even the genius of leaders cannot attain much. There you have an inexorable class enmity, one against all the others. There, the proletarian class must tip the scales for itself, through its power, its numbers. Its power, however, is based above all on its quality, the enemy being so mighty and endlessly better organized and armed than the proletariat. Uh, okay, and then we're going to take this. You pose Russian, Russian possessing classes as David opposed Goliath. David was little, but he had a deadly weapon. The German, the English, and the West European proletarian opposed capitalism as one giant does another. Between them, all depends on strength, strength of body, and above all, mind. Have you not observed, Comrade Lin, that in Germany there are no great leaders? They are all quite ordinary men. This points to the fact that the revolution must be, must in the first place be the work of the masses, not the leaders. To my idea, this is something more wonderful and grand than has ever been, and is an indication of what communism will be. And as it is in Germany, it is in all Western Europe, for everywhere the proletariat stands alone. The revolution of the masses, of the workers, of the masses of workers alone for the first time in the world. And not because thus it is good or beautiful or conceived in someone's brain, but because the economic and class relations will it. And we've got a footnote here. I do not touch here on the fact that though that through this other relation of numbers, 20 million to 70 million Germany, the importance of the mass and leaders and the relation between mass party and leaders, also in the course and the close of the revolution here, will differ from those of Russia. Alpha Q says, I feel like he minimizes the struggle of the Soviet revolution and he trivializes the challenges the Soviets face. Uh, no, that's not what he's aiming to do or what he is doing. What he's essentially saying is, hey, look, um, the peasantry knew that they needed to rally around a leader and essentially the and and this is fair right the bourgeoisie and the tsar in particular the aristocracy made it easy at the end stages of the of the conflict the position of the tsardom was so weak that they literally armed the Bolsheviks and asked them to, you know, keep the peace. There's, I sincerely question how much longer it would have taken for the Bolsheviks to achieve victory had World War I not happened. Um, continuing. In other words, and to read the matter as clearly as possible, the relation between the West European and Russian Revolution can be demonstrated by means of the following comparison. Supposing that in an Asiatic country like China or British India, where only one half of a percent of the inhabitants are industrial proletarians and 80% small peasants, a revolution should break out and should successfully be carried through by these sm those small peasants under the lead of the politically and socially more trained proletarians than were united in local trade that were united in local trade unions and cooperatives. If the Chinese or Indian workers proclaim to them, quote, we have won through our local trade unions and cooperatives, and now you must do the same with regard to your revolution. End quote. What would the war Russian workers have replied? They would have said, quote, Dear friends, this is impossible. Our country is far more developed than yours. With us not half, but 3% of the population are industrial proletarians. Our capitalism is more powerful than yours. Therefore, we need better and more powerful organizations than you did. End quote. From this difference between Russia and Western Europe, there follows likewise. 1. That when you, or the executive in Moscow, or the opportunist communists of Western Europe, or the Spartacus League, or the English Party, Communist Party says, quote, it is nonsense to fight about the question of leader or masses, end quote. 
that you are in the, that case as wrong as regards us, not only because we are yet trying to find these leaders, but also because for you this question had quite another meaning. Two, that when you say to us, quote, the leader and the mass should be one inseparable whole, quote, end quote, you are wrong, not only because you are striving for that unity, but also because that question has another meaning for us and you. Three, that when you may, quote, in the Communist Party there should reign iron discipline and absolute military centralization, end quote. This is wrong, not be only because we are seeking iron discipline and strong centralization, but also because this question has a different meaning for us and you. Four, that when you say, quote, we acted in such and such a way in Russia after the Kornilov offensive, for instance, or some other episode, or entered parliament during this or that period, or we remained in the trade unions, and therefore the German proletariat must do the same, end quote. All this means absolutely nothing, and need not or cannot be applicable in any way. For in West European class relations in the struggle and the revolution are quite different from those of Russia. 5. When you wish to force upon us tactics that were good in Russia, tactics, for instance, that were based, consciously or unconsciously, on the conviction that the, here the poor peasants will soon join the proletariat, in other words, that the proletariat does not stand alone, that your tactics, which you describe and which are followed here, will lead the West Euro European proletariat into ruin, the most terrible defeat. 6. That when you or the executive in Moscow, or the opportunist elements in Western Europe, like the Central Board of the Spartacus League, or the BSP, tried to compel us to follow opportunist, to, opportunist tactics. Opportunism always seeks the support of outside elements, so for sake of proletariat, you are wrong. Okay. Yeah. That, that was a long bit. I should have taken a break. Um, anyway. The general bases on which the tactics in Western Europe must be founded are, are these. The recognition that the proletariat stands alone, that it is to expect no help, that the importance of the mass is greater, and that leaders relatively smaller. This is not seen by Radek when he was in Germany, not by the executive in Moscow, nor by you, as is evident from your words. It is on these bases that the tactics of the Communist Arbeiter Party in Germany uh, the Communist Workers' Party in Germany. The Communist Party, Sylvia Pankhurst, uh, footnote, so far at least, <laughs> and the majority of the Amsterdam Commission, as appointed by Moscow, are founded. It is on these grounds that they strive, above all, to raise the masses as a whole, and the individuals to a higher level, to educate them one by one to be revolutionary fighters, by making them realize not through theory alone, but especially by practice. That all depends on them, and they are expecting they are to expect nothing from foreign help, very little from leaders, and all from themselves. Uh, so we're going to take this, and then we go like that, and we're also going to take uh, this. And continuing. Therefore, theoretically, therefore, and apart from private utterances, minor questions and exercises, much like those of Wolfheim and Laufenberg, are inevitable in the first phases of a movement. The view taken by these parties and comrades is quite right, and your opposition absolutely wrong. Footnote. It has struck me that in this controversy, you almost invariably make use of private, and not public voices of the opposition. Back to the text. On going from the east to the west of Europe, we traverse at any a given moment an economic boundary. It runs from the Baltic to the Mediterranean, somewhere from Danzig to Venice. This line divides two worlds. West of this line is a practical, absolute domination of industrial, commercial, and financial capital, united with the most highly developed banking capital. Even agricultural capital is subject to, or is compelled to unite with this capital. This capital is organized to the utmost degree and converges in the most firmly established state governments of the world. East of the line, there is neither this gigantic development of industrial, commercial, transport, and banking capital, not its almost absolute domination, nor consequently the firmly established modern state. 
It would be marvelous indeed if the tactics of the revolutionary proletariat west of this boundary line were the same as in the east. Okay. Um, part two, the question of the trade union. Having brought forward the general theoretical bases, I will now proceed to prove, also by practice, that the left wing in Germany and England is right in general principles on the question of the trade unions and parliamentarism. First, we will take the question of the trade unions. Quote, As parliamentarism embodies a spiritual, thus the trade union movement embodies the material power of the leaders over the masses of the workers. Under capitalism, the trade unions constitute the natural organizations for uniting the proletariat, and as such, Marx, already from the very beginning, had demonstrated their importance. Under a more developed capitalism, and to a greater extent even in the age of imperialism, the trade unions have ever more become gigantic unions, with a trend of development equal to that of the bourgeois state bodies themselves. They have produced a class of officials, a bureaucracy, that controls all the engines of power of the organization, the finances, the press, the appointment of lower officials, often is invested with even greater power, so that from a servant of the rank and file, it has become the master, identifying itself with the organization. The trade unions can be compared to the state and its bureaucracy also in this, that, notwithstanding the democracy is supposed to reign there, the members are unable to enforce their will against the bureaucracy. Every revolt is broken against the cleverly constructed apparatus of official ordinances and statutes before it has even been able to shake the highest regions. And then continuing, only the most tenacious perseverance over several years can obtain even a moderate result, which remains mostly restricted to a change of persons. In the last few years, before and after the war, in England, Germany, and America, this often gave rise to the rebellions of the members who started strikes of their own account against the will of the leaders or the decrees of the union itself. That this should be, seem natural and be accepted as such is an indication in itself that the organization does not represent the totality of the members, but something altogether foreign to them, and the workers do not control their union, but that the union is placed over them as an outside power against which they can rebel, a power which, all the same, has its origin in themselves, again therefore an analogy with the state. Once the revolt is over, the old dom domination begins anew. In spite of the hatred and impotent exasperation of the masses, this domination manages to maintain itself, owing to the indifference and lack of clear insight, and of a united indomitable will in the masses, and upheld as it is by the inner need for trade unions, which only mean the only means the workers have to gain strength or unity in their struggle against capital. All right. So to to be clear here, what is essentially being said is that um effectively the um Unions are ultimately a conservative organization as the struggle develops because they are ultimately reformist, right? They are looking for additional developments within capitalism. They're looking for higher wages. They're looking to escape from uh, the, uh, the vulgarities of the, of the uh, free market of labor and the competition of workers against workers. Um, but this makes it so trade unions are not actually really that interested, shall we say, in going beyond that. They they have won. They've, they've made all these developments. They've got their position. And then once they've got their position, the leaders of these trade unions, who are set apart from the other workers and take on a managerial role over the workers, that this is the conception of yellow unions, by the way, and the labor aristocracy, wherein some workers are granted um, excess control over their fellow workers by the bourgeoisie in order to internally manage their affairs while the bourgeoisie no longer have to. Managers develop in this sense. Yes, the, the managers are workers, but their work is to control the working class 
to the benefit of the um to the bourgeois right um and the union ends up being the same way in this sense now um does that so the question is whether or not we should break with the unions and under what circumstances and in what way. The unions are a fertile ground for training up additional workers to, to help them build up their own unity. So only means the workers have to gain strength through unity and their struggle against capital, right? So should we organize with unions? And the answer that they make is essentially kind of but not really and in addition to that the other thing is that the um see uh, this started strikes of their own account against the will of the leaders or the decrees of the union itself this is the worker councils the workers would end up having secretive leadership within them that would meet in meet in quiet and organized black cat strikes against the will of the union leaders who they had recognized to be in cahoots with the bourgeoisie right uh, to be yellow in in character so this is where the worker unions or sorry the uh worker councils arise out of how this struggle within the unions against the uh reformist sections of the unions that reject the need for transcending this so their argument is once the worker youth uh once the uh worker councils develop we don't need to organize with the unions anymore we need to organize with the um with the councils and then the councils need to go in and take command of those unions and then turn them into one big union type of thing but then that union isn't really for engaging in economic struggle except for particular purposes it's instead for transcending the economic struggle for the political struggle waning of trade union influence quote fighting against capital in a constant opposition against its tendency of increasing misery has enabled the working class through the restriction of these tendencies to keep the existence of the trade union movement has played its part under capitalism and thus it become a member of itself of capitalist society it is only at the beginning of the revolution when the proletariat from a member of capitalist society is turned into the annihilator of the society that the trade union finds itself in opposition to the proletariat that which Marx and Lenin demonstrate for the state that its organization in spite of formal democracy makes it impossible to turn it into an instrument of the proletarian revolution must also hold true good therefore for the trade union organizations their counter-revolutionary power cannot be destroyed or weakened through change of staff though through the replacing reactionary leaders by radical or revolutionary elements it is a form of organization that renders the masses as good as powerless and prevents them from turning the trade unions into their organs of their will. The revolution can triumph only if it completely destroys this organization. That is to say, if it alters the form of organization so fundamentally as to turn it into something altogether different. The Soviet system, the construction from within, is not only able to uproot and abolish the state, but also the trade union bureaucracy. It will constitute not only the new political organs of the proletariat as opposed to capitalism, but likewise a foundation for the new trade unions. If the party factions in Germany, the idea of a form of organization being revolutionary has been mocked at, because it is only the revolutionary sentiment, the revolutionary mind of the members, that matters. However, if the most important part of the revolution consists in the masses conducting their own concerns, the control of society and production, then every form of organization that does not allow the masses to rule and guide them for themselves must needs be counter-revolutionary and harmful, and as such it must be replaced by another form, which is revolutionary insofar as it allows the workers to decide matters for themselves. Through the very nature their very nature, the trade unions are useless arms for the West European Revolution. Apart from the fact that they have become tools of capitalism, 
that they are in the hands of traitors, apart from the fact that through their nature they are bound to make slaves of the members. No matter what the leaders may be, they are also unfit to use generals. And that is Panacex, um World Revolution and Communist Tactics. The Harder Task of Europe The trade unions are not too weak. Are, are, sorry, excuse me. The trade unions are too weak in the contest against the most highly organized capital in Western European states. These latter are not. The unions are not. To a great extent, the trade unions are professional unions as yet, which cannot make a revolution, if it were for that fact alone. And insofar as they are industrial unions, they are not found in the factories, onto workshops themselves, and are consequently weak. Also, they are more or unions for or mutual aid than for struggle, dating as they do from the days of the small bourgeoisie. Even before the revolution, their organization was already inadequate for the struggle. For the union revolution itself, it cannot serve at all in Western Europe. For the factories, the workers in these factories make the revolution, not the industries and professions, but in the workshops. Moreover, these unions are far too slow working, complicated instruments, good only for the evolutionary period. Even if the revolution should not succeed right away, and we once more had to revert to peaceful action for a while, the trade unions would have to be destroyed and replaced by industrial unions on the basis of industrial or workshop organization. And with these miserable trade unions, they, that must be done away with in any case. They want to make the revolution. The workers in Western Europe need weapons for the revolution. The only weapons for the revolution in Western Europe are the industrial organization, and these unite into one big whole. So the IWW, which, by the way, decided not to uh, attach themselves to any worker organization. They instead said, we're going to be politically neutral. And that led them to not being able to do jack shit when political act activity came after them. <laughs> Okay, continuing. The workers in Western Europe need the very best weapons. They stand alone. They have no help. And therefore, they need these industrial organizations. In Germany and England, they need them at once. Because they're, they're, the revolution is nearest at hand. The other countries must have them as soon as possible, as soon as we can build them. It is no good at all, Comrade Lenin, you're saying. In Russia, we did it in such and such a way. For in the first place, you had no organizations that were so inadequate for the struggle as many as the th trade unions are here. You had industrial unions. Secondly, your workers were more revolutionary in spirit. Thirdly, the organization of the capitalists was weak, and the state also. And in the fourth place, and this is the main point, you had help. You did not need the very best weapons. We stand alone. We must have them. We will not win unless we have them. We will be defeated over and over again unless we have them. Other grounds and material ones also demonstrate this. Recall in your mind, comrade, how things were in Germany before and during the war. The trade unions, the far too weak but only means, were entirely in the hands of the leaders who used them as dead machines on behalf of capitalism. Then the revolution broke out. The trade unions were used by the leaders and the masses of, of members as a weapon against the revolution. It was through their help, through their cooperation, through their leaders, nay, partly even through their members, that the revolution was murdered. The communists saw their own brothers being shot with the cooperation of the trade unions. Strikes in favor of the revolution were prevented, rendered impossible. Do you hold it possible, comrade, that under such conditions revolutionary workers should remain in these unions? especially when these latter are utterly inadequate instruments for the revolution. In my opinion, this is a physical impossibility. What would you yourself have done, as a member of a political party, that the Menshevists, for example, if these had acted thus in the revolution, you would have split the party if you had not already done so? You will reply, quote, This is a political party. It is different in the case of a trade union. I believe you're mistaken. In the revolution, during the revolution, every trade union, every workers' union even, is a political party, either pro- or counter-revolution. 
In your article, however, you say, and you will do so now, these emotional impulses must be conquered for the sake of unity and communist propaganda. I will show you by means of concrete examples that during the revolution this was impossible in Germany. For these questions must be con also considered quite concretely. Let's suppose that Germany had 100,000 really revolutionary dock laborers, 100,000 revolutionary metal workers, and 100,000 revolutionary miners. That they, these were willing to strike, to fight, to die for the revolution, and the other millions were not. What are these 300,000 to do? They must in the first place unite and form a fighting league. This you acknowledge. Without organization, workers can do nothing. Now a new league against old unions, even if the workers remain the old ones, is a split already, if not formally at any rate, actually, in reality. Next, however, the members of the new league need a press, meetings, localities, a salaried staff. This requires heaps of money. And the German workers possess next to nothing. In order to keep the new league going, they must need, whether you like it or not, leave the old one. Thus we see that, concretely considered, that which you, comrade, propose is impossible. So I'll take that. Build on new foundation. However, there are better material grounds yet. The German workers who left the trade unions, that wished to destroy them, that created the industrial organizations and workers' unions, stood in the revolution. It was necessary to fight at once. The revolution was there. The trade unions refused to fight. What good then of saying, remain in the trade unions, propagate your ideas, you will go stronger and become the majority. Far from the fact that the minority would be strangled, as is custom there, this would be quite fine, and also the left wing would try it if there's only time to do so. But it was impossible to wait. The revolution had begun and is still going on. In the revolution, Mein comrade, it was in the revolution that the German workers split the party and created their own workers' union. The revolutionary workers will always separate themselves from the social patriots. In the struggle, no other way is possible. And no matter what you, the Moscow executive, and the International Congress say, and no matter how much you dislike a split in the party, it will always take place on psychological and material grounds, because the workers cannot in the long run tolerate the trade union shooting them because there has to be fighting. So I'm going to take this. This is why the left wing has created the workers' unions. As they believe, and as they believe that the revolution in Germany is not yet over, but it will proceed to the final victory, they keep them up. Comrade Lin, is there another way out? In the workers' movement, when two trends come up, but that of fighting. And when these trends are very divergent, if they oppose one another, is there another way out but succession? Did you ever hear of any other? And is there anything more opposed in revolution and counter-revolution? For this reason, again, the KAPD and the General Workers' Unions are quite right. And you, comrade, have not these successions. These clearances always been a blessing for the proletariat. Does not always just become evident after a while. I have had some experience in this matter. When we as yet belonged to the Social Patriotic Party, we had no influence. After our expulsions, expulsions we had some. In the beginning, and very soon we won a great, a very great influence. And how about you, the Bolshevists, after this accession? I believe you fared quite well. Small influence at first, very much later on. And all now. It, depends, it all depends on the economic and political development whether a group, be it ever so small, does become the most powerful party. If the revolution in Germany lasts, there is fair hope that the importance and the influence of the workers' unions will surpass all the others. You should not be intimidated by their numbers, 70,000 against 7 millions. Smaller groups than these have become the strongest, the Bolsheviks among others. The industrial unions and the workshop organizations, and the workers' unions that are based on them and formed from them, why are they such excellent weapons for the revolution in Western Europe, the best weapons even together with the Communist Party? Because the workers act for themselves, infinitely more so than they did in the old trade unions. Because now they control their leaders, and thereby the entire leadership, 
because they have the supervision of the industrial organization and thereby of the entire union. Every trade, every workshop is one whole, where the workers elect their representatives. The industrial organizations have been divided according to economic districts. Representatives have been appointed for the districts, and the districts in turn elect the general board for the entire state. All the industrial organizations together, no matter to what trade they belong, constitute to the one workers' union. This, as we see, is an organization altogether directed towards the revolution. If an interval of comparatively peaceful fighting should follow, this organization might moreover be easily adapted. The industrial revolution... Industrial organizations would only have to be combined according to the industry within the compass of the workers' unions. Okay, I'm going to take this. Or not, we're going to go like this. And then uh, every trade. Continuing. Um, the worker has power. It is obvious, here the worker, every worker, has power, for in his workshop he elects his own delegates, and through them he has direct control over the district and state bodies. There is strong centralization, but not too strong. The individual and in the industrial organization has great power. He can dismiss or replace his delegates at any time, and compel them to replace the higher positions at the shortest notice. This is individualism, but not too much of it. For the central corporations, the districts and government councils have great power. The individual and the central board have just that amount of power, which this present period in which a revolution breaks out requires and allows. Marx writes that under capitalism, the citizen is an abstraction, a cipher as compared to the state. It is the same in the trade unions. The bureaucracy, the entire system of the organization playing ever so far above, are altogether out of the reach of the worker. He cannot reach them. He is a cipher compared to them, an abstraction. For them, he is not even the man in the workshop. He is not a willing, living, struggling being. Even in the old, if in the old trade unions you replace the bureaucracy by other persons, you will see that before long, these also have the same character, that they stand high, unattainably high above the masses, and are in no way in touch with them. 99 out of every 100 will be tyrants and will stand on the side of the bourgeoisie. It is the very nature of the organization that makes them so. Uh, I'm going to take this real quick. Your tactics strive to lead the, old, the trade unions as they are, quote, down below, and only to give them to them other leaders somewhat more of the left trend is therefore purely a change, quote, up above. And the trade unions remain in the power of leaders. And these, once spoiled, everything is as of old, or at the very best, a slight improvement of, in the layer up above. No, not even if you yourself, or if we ourselves, were their leaders, we would not consent to this. We would wish to enable the masses themselves to become more intelligent, more courageous, self-acting, more elevated in all things. We want the masses themselves to make the revolution. For only thus the tri revolution can triumph here in Western Europe. And to this end, the old trade unions must be destroyed. Industrial workers decide. How utterly different it is in the industrial unions. Here it is that the worker himself who decided about tactics, trend, struggle, and intervenes if the, quote, leaders do not act as he wants them to. The factory, the workshop, being in the same time the organization, he stands continually in the fight himself. Insofar as it is possible under capitalism, he is a maker and guide of his own fate. And as this is the case with every one of them, the mass is the maker and the leader of its own fight more, infinitely more so, than was ever possible in the old trade unions, reformists as well as syndicalists. But note, uh, that was 10. It has to be borne in mind, of course, that this new combination of individualism and centralism is not given right away in its complete form, but that is only springing up now, and is a process which will develop only in the struggle itself, and thus perfected. 
back to the text. The industrial unions and workers' unions make the individuals themselves, and consequently the masses themselves, the direct fighters. Those that really wage the war are for, the very ve for that very reason the best weapons for the revolution. The weapons we need here in Western Europe, if we, are ever, if we ever shall be without help to overthrow the most powerful capitalism of the world. But comrade, these are only the weaker grounds yet, as composed the last, main actual reason which hangs closely together with the principles I have indicated at the beginning. It is this last ground which is decisive for the KAPD and the opposition party in England. These parties strive greatly to raise the spiritual level of the masses and the individuals in Germany and England. They are the opinion that there is only one means to that end, and I would like you and I should like to know whether you you know of another means of the labor movement. It is the formation of a group. That shows in the struggle what the mass should be. That shows fighting what the mass must be. If you know of another means, comrade, tell me so. I know none other. In the labor movement, and especially I imagine in the revolution, there is but one way to prove the example. The example itself, the deed. The comrades of the left wing believe that this small group, in its fight against trade unions and against capitalism, will win the trade unions to its side. Or, which is also possible, that gradually the trade unions will be directed towards a better course. This can only be attained through the example, for the raising of the German worker to a high level, and therefore these new organizations are absolutely indispensable. The formation, the workers' union, must act against the trade unions, in exactly the same way the communist parties act against the socialist parties. But note, with the sarcastic remark that also the workers' unions cannot be faultless, we make little impression. It is right only in so far as that the union must fight for reforms under capitalism. It is not right in so far that the union fights for the revolution. Back to the text. The servile, reformist, social patriotic masses can convert, be converted only through example. Next I come to England, to the English left wing. After Germany, England is nearest to a revolution. Not because in that country the situation is revolutionary already, but because the proletariat there are so numerous and the, cap and the capitalist and economic conditions most favorable. Only a strong blow is needed there and the fight will begin again, a fight which can only end in a victory. And then the blow will come. This is felt, this is almost instinctively known, by the most advanced workers of England, as we all feel it. And because they feel this, they have founded a new movement which, whilst manifesting itself in various directions, and searching as yet, just in Germany, is, a, is in general the rank and file movement, the movement of the masses themselves, without or practically without leaders, um, and footnote, shop committees, shop, shop stewards, and especially in Wales, industrial unions. Their movement is very much like the German workers' union and its industrial organizations. Did you observe, comrade, that this movement has arisen in two of the most advanced countries only, and from the ranks of the workers themselves, and in many places, footnote, that this movement in Germany was made above, from above its slander? This proves already in itself that it is a natural growth and not to be stopped. Continuing. Struggle in England Essential and in England, this movement, the struggle against the trade unions, is needed more almost than in Germany. For the English trade unions are not only a tool in the hands of the leaders, or the maintenance of capitalism, but they are at the same time far more inefficient as a means for the revolution than those of Germany. The way they are conducted dates from the time of the small struggle, often as far back as the 19th or even 18th century. England not only has industries where 25 trade unions exist, but most of these unions fight one another to the death for members, and the members are utterly without power. Do you also wish to retain these trade unions, Comrade Lennon? Must not these be opposed, split up, and destroyed? If you are against the workers' unions, you must also be against the shop committees, the shop stewards, and the industrial unions. Wherever, whoever is in favor of the latter is also in favor of the former. For the communists in either aim at the same, in either aim at the same things. The English communists of the left wing 
wished to use this new trend in the trade union movement to destroy the English trade unions in their present shape, to alter them, to replace them by new instruments in the class struggle, which can be applied toward a revolution. The same reasons that we have brought forward the German movement holds good here. In the postscript of the Executive Committee to the Third International of the KPD, I have read that the EC is in favor of the IWW in America, as long as this latter wishes only political action and affiliation to the Communist parties. And these IWW need not join the American trade unions. But the Executive Committee is also is against the workers' union in Germany. This latter must join the trade unions, although it is communist, and works in cooperation with the political party. And you, Comrade Lin, are in favor of the rank-and-file movement in England, although this often causes a split, and although member of, many of its members want the destruction of the trade unions, and against the workers' unions in Germany. Executive Committee's Opportunism I can explain your attitude in that of the Executive Committee only by opportunism, and the mistaken opportunism to boot. It goes without saying that the left wing of the Communists in England cannot go as far as in Germany. Because in England, the revolution has not begun yet. It cannot as yet organize the rank and file movement all over the country into one whole for the revolution. But the English left wing is preparing for this. As soon as the revolution comes, the great masses of workers will leave the old trade unions as unserviceable for the revolution and will join the industrial organizations. And as the left wing commun as the left communist wing penetrates everywhere into this movement, seeking to spread the communist ideas, it raises the workers by means of its example onto a higher level. And also in RA now, and as in Germany, that is a real aim. Footnote. You, comrade, and many with you, use here the argument that the communists, by leaving the trade unions, lose touch with the masses. But is not the closest touch obtained in the workshops? And have not all the workshops turned more into, than ever into debating halls? How can the left communists possibly lose touch then? All right, so um, I do question whether or not Lenin was aware that the left communist movement was actually organizing in the workshops um, at the same time rather than simply abandoning the unions entire because what's really happened here is that rather than going to the workers through the unions they're going to the workers through the workshops um and as I recall in Lenin's Left Communism and Infantile Disorder, he criticized their leaving the unions on grounds that they were leaving access to the workers. But I don't remember him ever bringing up these workshops or, or even critiquing that um, at all. In other words, it sounds like he was unaware of the additional work that they were doing that was more close to the ground. Okay, continuing. The general workers' unions and the rank-and-file movements, which are both founded on the factories, the workshops and on these alone, are the forerunner of the workers' councils, the Soviets. As the revolution in Western Europe will be very difficult and consequently be of probably very long duration, there will be a very long position of transition in which the trade unions are no longer any good, which are no Soviets as of yet. This period of transition will be filled out in the struggle against the trade unions. They're reformatting, they're replacing by better organizations. You need not fear, we will have ample time. No. No, you didn't. <laughs> uh, this is written in 1920, by the way. You did not have ample time, I'm sorry. Anyway, once again, this will be so, not because of the left wing will it, will it so, but because the revolution must have needs, must needs have these new organizations. The revolution cannot thrive without them. Oh, still, I'll, I'll, um, I'll put this in. To be fair. At least in 
modern times, we seem to have... Well, no, we don't have ample time. That's freaking climate change. Wasn't this written after the German Revolution? Um, so, I think that happened in 1901. Let me spark the... This uprising. That was 1919. Um, so the workers movement had just gotten utterly crushed. And all the um, communist organizers executed or arrested. And um, the basis for organizing really kicked back. Um, and the fry corps had really they, they were really organizing and so on and so forth uh fascist uh syndicalist unions were emerging out on the scene so yeah that's that's what that's referencing by the way the um the unions were very much aligning with uh fascist ideology at the time because it was promising um it was promising everything that the reformist unions wanted, which was essentially union con control over the uh, state um, and so on and so forth. This is where a lot of the quote-unquote left wing of the fascist movement was. And there's some interesting stuff I could point to on that, um, discussing the characteristics. But ultimately, Hitler was the man of the big bourgeoisie and got the majority of the funding. So when he did his uh, Night of Long Knives and removed the other fascist movements, um, he had the most power and support and was able to take over what remnants there were. There were many fascists within uh, that that really were actually... They were for what we might call workers' rights and stuff. They were social patriots, as uh, as are discussed in this text. Um, they called for all sorts of um, support from the state and so on and so forth. But they had abandoned the whole question of left or right or workers' power or bourgeois power. They had abandoned class struggle. They said, instead, the whole of this class struggle stuff is nonsense. It's a national struggle, social patriotism. Um, and in addition, all these quote-unquote left-wing elements like the Strasserists and whatnot got murdered. Um, uh, Self-consuming. Self yeah, the phalangists um, were very much in this... Uh, missing and and that's why you get uh <laughs> gosh you know i've i've not really researched the spanish stuff enough um but mussolini is the one that i would really point to here um and best d marx has a very good youtube series on the character of fascism within um or, or on Mussolini himself. Uh, I would suggest watching that. Yes, class collaborationism rather than class struggle with the intent of the fascist unions essentially directing production. And remember that the, U that the bourgeoisie would actually seek out and want to have their own union internally because then they could have the unions do all the management of the workers. And there would be this class collaboration, this layer in between the bourgeoisie and the workers, wherein the workers would focus on the union and then the bourgeoisie would be on the background just raking in all the surplus value and, uh, and holding control over the state and so on and so forth. And it was a lucrative relationship between the bourgeoisie and the collaborationist uh, trade union leadership. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a pretty brutal state of affairs, that's for sure. Um, and, you know, 
I do wonder how tra industrial unionism arose. I know in America, it's been historically extremely popular for very good reasons at that. Um, but again, the industrial unions, the IWW, decided not to align with any political party and remain um, a purely economic organization. And we all know exactly how that worked out. Not great. Back to the text. Hail the rank and file movement. All hail, therefore, the rank and file movement in England and the workers' unions in Germany, first forerunners of the Soviets in Europe. Good luck to you, the first organizations that, with the Communist parties, will bring the revolution in Western Europe. You, Comrade Lenin, wish to compel us to use bad weapons here in Western Europe, where we stand alone without a single ally against an as yet extremely powerful, extremely organized, and armed capitalism. And where we stand in need of the very best of weapons, the very strongest. What, where we want to organize the revolution on the shop floor and on a shop floor basis, you wish to force the miserable trade unions on us. The revolution in Western Europe can and must be organized only on the shop floor and on a shop floor basis, because here capitalism has attained such a high economic and political organization in all directions, and because the workers, except for the Communist Party, have no other strong weapons. The Russians were armed and they had the poor peasants. What the weapons and the peasants were for the Russians, tactics and organization must be for us for the time being. And then you recommend the trade unions. For psychological as well as for material grounds, in the midst of the revolution, we must fight these trade unions, and you try to hinder us in this fight. We can fight only by means of splitting up, and you, prevent, you are preventing us. We wish to form groups that are to be an example. The only way of showing the proletariat what is we seek, and you forbid this. We wish to raise the proletariat of Europe to a higher level, and you throw stones in our path. You do not wish in the splitting up, the new formations, the higher stage of development. And why not? Because you want to have the big parties and the big trade unions in the Third International. To us, this line looks like opportunism, opportunism of the worst kind. Footnote. Already now, the trade union questions question clearly demonstrates where the opportunist tactics of Moscow lead. The members of the Communist parties are forced to enter the modern trade unions. See the thesis accepted on this point. They are forced, therefore, to become scabs and strike breakers. Because, again, um, the workers within these trade unions were organizing against their trade union leaders black hat strikes, illegal strikes that were without the... Uh, the ascent of the um of the labor organizer um leadership so in other words by joining the uh union um and then actually follow the dictates of it the uh union leaders of course would ignore these black cat strikes because they would have to and then the communists would have to act as strike breakers in support of these uh, these union leaders. Continuing. At the same time, they must openly support the syndicalists. Triple um, exclamation mark. <laughs> Instead of openly saying that neither of these organizations are any good and that new ones have to be formed on the basis of the industries, the VCs themselves declare elsewhere that this is what should be done. They adopt this ambiguous attitude. And why? To add masses to the Third International. Back to the text. Today in the International, your actions differ widely from what they were in the Maximalist Party. This is kept very, quote, pure, and are to this day, perhaps. In the International, all elements are to be accepted right away, no matter how poorly communistic they are. It is a curse of the labor movement that, as soon as it has acquired a certain, quote, power, it seeks to enlarge its power by unprincipled means. Social democracy was all originally also was originally, quote, pure in almost all countries. Most social patriots of today were real Marxists. By Marxist propaganda, the masses were won, and as soon as the party gained, quote, power, they were abandoned. Just as the social democrats acted at the time, you and the Third International are acting now. Not on a national scale, of course, but internationally. The Russian Revolution has triumphed through, quote, purity, through firmness of principle. 
Now it has gained power, and through it, the international proletariat has gained, obtained power. This power is to be extended over Europe, and immediately the old tactics abandoned. Instead of applying the same efficacious tactics in all of the other countries to the inner strengthening of the Third International, opportunism is again resorted to as before in social democracy. All elements are now to be affiliated, the trade unions, the independents, the French center, parts of the Labour Party. To preserve the semblance of Marxism, conditions are put to, are put to have to be signed, and Kautsky, Helferding, Thomas, etc. are expelled. The great mass, however, the medium quality, is admitted, is driven in by all possible means. And in the order that the center should be all more powerful, the, quote, left wing, is not admitted unless it joins that center. The very best revolutionaries, like the KPD, are excluded. And when the huge masses have thus been united on one average line, they proceed to one common advance under an iron discipline, and with leaders have been tested in this extraordinary manner. A common advance wither into the abyss. Failure of the Second International what is the use of the finance principles of the most splendid theses of the Third International if in practice we exercise opportun its opportunism? The Second International also had the finance principles, yet it failed through practice. We, however, the left wing, refused to do so. In Western Europe, we wish to build a very firm, very clear, and very strong, though from the outset perhaps quite small, parties, kernels, just as you did in Russia. And once we have those, we will make them bigger. But you always want them to be very firm, very strong, very, quote, pure. Only thus can we triumph in Western Europe. Therefore, we absolutely reject your tactics, comrade. You say that we, the members of the Amsterdam Commission, have forgotten or have never known the lessons former revolutions have taught. Well, comrade, there is one thing about these former revolutions which I remember quite well. It is this, that the extreme, quote, left parties have always played a prominent, imminent part in all of them. It was such in the revolutions of the Netherlands against Spain, in the English Revolution, and that of France, and the Commune, and the two Russian revolutions. That's definitely true. In accordance with the development of the labor movement, there are two trends here in the West European Revolution, the radical and the opportunist trend. These can only arrive at sound tactics at unity by means of mutual struggle. The radical trend, however, through in some particulars it may go too far, is much the best. And yet you, Comrade Lenin, go and support the opportunists. Not only this, the executives in Moscow, the Russian leaders of a revolution that triumphed only through the help of millions of poor peasants, forces these tactics on the proletariat of Western Europe, which stands and has to stand alone, and so doing annihilates the best trend in Western Europe. What incredible foolishness, and especially what dialectics. When the revolution in Western Europe breaks out, it will work for you blue wonders, but the proletariat will be the victim. You know, Lenin did this too, just throw dialectics around without actually saying what, 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 what dialectics. It's a little frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, continuing. You, comrade, and the executive in Moscow know that the trade unions in Western Europe are counter-revolutionary forces. This is evident from your theses, and yet you wish to retain them. You also know that the workers' union, the rank-and-file movement, are revolutionary organizations. You, saw your, you say yourself in your theses that the industrial organizations must be in our, our aim, and you, you want to smother them. You want to destroy the organizations in which the workers, every worker, and therefore the mass, can attain power and strength, and to keep those in which the mass is a dead tool in the hands of the leaders. Thus you strive to bring the trade unions and your power in the power of the Third International. Why is it that you wish to do so? Why do you follow these bad tactics? Because you want the masses around you, no matter what quality, as long as they are masses. Because you believe that only... If only you have the masses obeying you on account of a strict discipline and centralization, no matter whether they are communists, half communists, or not communists at all, you, the leaders, will win in a word because your tactics are leader tactics. 
By criticizing leader tactics, I do not mean to advocate politics without leaders and centralization. For without those, these one attains nothing. They are indispensable as a party. I am criticizing these politics that collect masses without inquiring into their convictions, their heart. Politics has assumed that the leaders, once they have the great masses around them, will be able to win. Okay. Russian tactics useless in Western Europe. But these politics, which you and the executive are now following, will lead nowhere in Western Europe. Capitalism here is too far powerful as yet, and the proletariat is much too isolated. These politics will fail here, just as the Second International did. Here the workers themselves must become strong, and through them their leaders. Here the evil leadership policy must be seized by the root. Through these, your tactics on the trade union question, you and the Moscow executive have proved to my mind, that unless you alter these tactics, you cannot conduct a revolution in Western Europe. You say that the left wing, in following its tactics, can only talk. Well, comrade, in the other countries, the left wing has had next to no opportunities as yet to act. But look at Germany and the tactics and actions of the KPD and the Kap, Kap push um, with the regard to Russian Revolution, and you will have to take back those words. Uh, so I'm going to take this. This is a good short sentence. Actually, two sentences. Okay, so let's talk about what was said here. Essentially, he's saying that Lenin's seeking to embrace the trade unions, which were at the time syndicalist, um, reformist, social patriotic, and so on and so forth, um, rather than demanding that all communists, which would have counted in the millions and made up a significant amount, if not the majority, of the union movements, should instead go in and build industrial unions. Should instead do a very short-termist position of aligning with the industrial unions, these reformist and and uh, counter-revolutionary organizations. Gorder is saying, hey, look, we're already organizing on the floor, on the workshop with the workers. We're already in with the workers. All we need to do is organized to develop an industrial union, one big union that actually centers the power of the workers rather than the leadership of the unions. If we do that, then we can actually use this as a springboard for actual organizing, utilizing actual communists that are actually interested in transcending economic struggle. But because Lenin is requiring in the... Uh, requirements to be within the Third International, that the communist organizations have their membership remain within the unions and actually report to the trade union leadership. This is in turn making it so it's impossible for them to actually develop these industrial unions, despite it at the same time advocating for the construction of those industrial unions within the in, within the third international um so at some point there was a misstep within the third international and he's uh, blaming in on opportunism um by lenin due to his focus on leadership policy wherein his mindset is that the workers can achieve victory through leadership so long as they just you know fall in line through discipline and he's saying that this works with the peasantry but it's not going to work with the workers okay let's get back to the text and i by the way i happen to agree strongly with border here especially i had I had translated this as Lin when I had been reading Lenin's criticisms as him saying we shouldn't, or rather the left communist movement 
should not ally with any unions because they are reformists in character. Um, but that's not what's being demanded here by the left movement. They are specifically calling for industrial unionism. They're specifically calling for organization in the workshops, on the factory floor, in worker councils, and the development of those worker councils. So this is all stuff that I think that all of us can agree with. In America right now, we're seeing a significant resurgence of trade unionism. Um, Starbucks, Hollywood, um, a lot of uh, industrial uh, or industry trade unions. Not so much the Wobblies, which is disappointing. Though, of course, the Wobblies have their own problems. I keep on referencing the fact that they made the political decision not to get political. <laughs> idiots. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not that they're idiots. It's that clearly somebody was counter-revolutionary there. <laughs> anyway, continuing. Part three, parliamentarism. Next, we have to take up the defense of the left wing on the question of parliamentarism. And we've got a footnote here. Originally, I considered this a minor point. The attitude of the Spartacus League, however, at the time of the Cap Putsch and your opportunist brochure, opportunists even on this question, have convinced me that it is of great importance. Back to the text. The same universal theoretical grounds that we dealt with here for the trade unions determined the attitude of the left wing in this question also. The fact that the proletariat stands alone, the gigantic force of the enemy, and consequently the necessity for the mass to raise itself to a much higher level, to rely, and to rely entirely on its own support. I need not repeat these grounds here. Here, however, there are a few more grounds than even on the trade reunion question. Subjects of bourgeois democracy. In the first place, the workers of Western Europe and the working masses in general are completely subjected, as far as ideas are concerned, to bourgeois system of representation, to parliamentarism, to bourgeois democracy, much more so than the workers of Eastern Europe. Here, bourgeois ideology has taken strong hold in the thought whole of social and political life. It has penetrated far more into the heads and hearts of the workers. Here they have already been brought up in the ideology for hundreds of years. These ideas have altogether saturated the workers. These relations have been very well depicted by Comrade Panikek in the Vien Viennese periodical Communismus. Quote, the experience of Germany places us far face to face with the great problem of the revolution in Western Europe. In these countries, the old bourgeois method of production and the corresponding highly developed culture in many centuries have made a thorough impression on the thoughts and feelings of the masses. Consequently, the spiritual and mental character of the masses here is quite different from that of the eastern countries, where they had not experienced this domination of bourgeois culture. And here and above all lies the difference in the progress of the revolution in the Middle East and in the West. In England, France, Holland, Scandinavia, Italy, and Germany, ever since the Middle Ages, there has been a strong bourgeoisie and a, with petty bourgeoisie and primitive capitalist production. Whilst feudalism was being defeated, an equally strong independent peasantry sprang up in the country, which was master of its own small sphere. On this soil, bourgeois civic spiritual life developed into a firm national culture especially in the coastlands of England and France, which were the most advanced by capitalist development. In the 19th century capitalism, by bringing the whole of agriculture under its power and pulling even the most isolated farms into the circle of the world economy, has raised this natural, national culture to a higher level, has refined it, and by means of its spiritual methods of propaganda, the press, the school, and the church, has finally beat it firmly into the brains of the masses it has proletarianized, both those who were sucked into the seas and those who were left on the land. This applies not only to the original capitalist countries, but also through somewhat modified form to America and Australia, where Europeans founded new states, and to the countries of Central Europe that, would, that had until then stagnated, 
Germany, Austria, Italy, where new capitalist development could link up with old, obsolete, petty bourgeois economy, economics, and culture. In the eastern countries of Europe, capitalism found quite different material and other traditions. Here in Russia, Poland, Hungary, and in the region of the east of the Elbe, there is no small, strong bourgeois class dominating spiritual life since time immemorial. Primitive agrarian relations which, with, with large-scale landed property, patriarchal feudalism, and village communism determined spiritual life. End quote. Here on the ideological problem, Comrade Panikwak has hit the nail on the head. Far better than has ever been done for your side, he has demonstrated the difference between the East and the West of Europe from the ideological angle and has given the cue towards finding revolutionary tactics for Western Europe. This only needs to be combined with material causes for the power of our opponents, that is to say with banking capital, and the tactics become perfectly clear. Workers win rights for possessing class. However, there's yet more to be said for the ideological question. Civil liberties, the power of parliament, has won in Western Europe by means of wars for liberty, waged by former generations by the ancestors. And though at the time these rights were only for citizens, for the possessing class, they were won by the people all the same. And the thought that these struggles is a day a deeply rooted tradition in the blood of this people. Revolutions are always the deepest memories of a people. Unconsciously, the thought that meant a victory to achieve representation in Parliament has been a tremendous silent force. This is especially the case in the oldest bourgeois countries, where long or repeated wars have been waged for freedom, in England, Holland, and France. Though, also on a smaller scale in Germany, Belgium, and the Scandinavian countries. An inhabitant of the East cannot realize, perhaps, how strong this influence can be. Moreover, the workers themselves have fought here, often for years, for universal suffrage, and have thus obtained it, directly or indirectly. This is also a victory, which bore fruit at the time. The thought and feeling generally prevails that is progress, and a victory, to be represented and to entrust one's representative with the cares of one's affairs in Parliament. The influence of this ideology is enormous. And finally, reformism has brought the working class of Western Europe altogether under power of the parliamentary representatives, who have led it into war and into alliances with capitalism. The influence of reformism is also colossal. All these causes have made the worker the slave of parliament, to which he leaves all action. He himself does not act any longer. Footnote. This great influence. This entire ideology of West of Europe, of the United States, and of the British colonies is not understood in Eastern Europe, in Turkey, the Balkans, etc., to say nothing of Asia, etc. Then comes the revolution. Now he has to act for himself. Now the worker, alone with his class, must fight the gigantic enemy, must wage the terrible fight, most terrible fight that ever was. No tactics of the leaders can help him. Desperately, the classes, all classes, oppose the worker, and not one class sides with them. On the contrary, if he should trust his work leaders, or other classes in Parliament, he runs a great risk of falling back into his old weakness of letting leaders act for him, of trusting Parliament, of persevering in the old notion that others can make the revolution for him, of pursuing illusions, of remaining in the old bourgeois ideology. This relationship of the masses to leaders has also been excellently characterized by Comrade Panikwak. Quote, Parliamentarism is a typical form of the kind of fight carried out by means of leaders, in which the masses themselves play but a minor part. Its practice consists in this, that representatives, individual persons, carry on with the actual fighting. With the masses, it therefore must sit, awaken the illusion that others can do the fighting for them, Formerly, formerly, the belief was that the leaders could obtain important reforms for the workers through Parliament. Many had even the illusion that the members of Parliament, by means of laws and regulations, could carry out that transition to socialism. Today, since parliamentarism acts in a more honest way, the argument is heard that the representatives may do things in Parliament for communist propaganda. Even again, the importance of the leaders is emphasized, and it is only natural that professionals should decide about 
politics, being the Democratic Guides of Congress, discussions and resolutions. The history of social democracy is a series of fruitless attempts to let the members determine their own politics. Wherever the proletariat goes in for a parliamentary session, all this is inevitable, as all the masses have not yet created organs for self-activities, as long, therefore, as the revolution has not broken out. As soon as the masses can act for themselves and can consequently decide, the disadvantages of parliamentarism become paramount. The problem of tactics is how to eradicate the traditional bourgeois way of thinking that saps the strength of the mass of the proletariat. Everything that which reinforces the traditional view is wrong. The most, more, most firmly rooted, most tenacious part of this mental attitude is dependence on leaders, to whom it leads the decisions in all general questions and the control of all class matters. Inevitably, parliamentarism has a tendency to crush the ma in the masses the activity necessary for the revolution. No matter what fine speeches are delivered to inspire the workers to revolutionary deeds, revolutionary action does not spring from such words but from the keen and hard necessity that leaves no choice what no other choice whatsoever demands of the revolution the revolution also demands something more than the fighting action of the masses that overthrows the government and which we know and which as we know is not under the control of the leaders but can only come from the deeply felt impulse of the masses the revolution demands that the great questions of social construction be taken in hand that difficult decisions shall be made, that the entire proletariat be roused to one creative impulse. And this is only possible if first the advance guard, in an, own, an ever greater mass, takes things in hand. A mass is conscious of its responsibilities, that searches, propagates, fights, strides, reflects, considers, dares, and carries out. All this is, however, hard work. So long as the proletariat thinks that there is an easier way, letting others act for it by carrying out agitation from a high platform, by taking decisions, by giving signals for action, by making laws, it will hesitate, and the old ways of thinking and the old weakness will keep them pacified. Right, so I don't remember where we left off. I paused it, um, so it might be a little weird with this break, but um to go over what we are talking about in a sense you know I, I don't know if we can say that america has this consciousness of leaders wherein um this long democratic tradition and i'm talking about america because i'm american but i'm sure it's the case elsewhere usually less than half of the population ever votes in fact if we look at the presidential shares, back when this was being written, it was at a historical high of 25% of the total population of potential voters within America that actually voted. That doesn't scream to me like there's some ubiquitous culture that believes that representatives will get stuff done within America. Um, and this also goes especially true for what is kind of being represented in Parliament, which is your Senate and House and Representatives in our case. And far less people actually go and vote for their senator or whatever. And as Limonade says, Parliament doesn't represent the masses as the majority of masses don't even participate in it. Yeah, that's obviously the case if people actually paid attention to the people who didn't vote then it would automatically it should cry trigger a crisis of legitimacy for the uh bourgeois state because it should be like hey listen you're not even getting 25 percent or you're not getting you're not even getting half a half a, the people in support of your institution um, but it is structured in such a way that only people who are in recognizing the system are recognized by the system, which, which is quite convenient. Um, yes, parliamentarism somehow makes all the parties converge to a single position, which is wild. This is the nature of competition. Uh, bourgeois democracy is 
uh, as is obvious, has its basis in competition. Um, and for all the same reasons that you end up with a standardized model, um, that is the case. And in addition, we you have to understand that um, the role of the state within within bourgeois society is to support the bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie are not a unified whole. What they're unified on is their common interest in maximizing surplus value extraction, supporting national bourgeoisie, uh, and, and of course, international bourgeoisie, mm. and um, maintaining the sanctity and power of private property. And there's all sorts of state and ideological apparatuses around that, but because there are some divisions in the bourgeoisie, for example, there's some bourgeoisie who want higher tariffs, others who want no tariffs. They need to somehow peacefully um, determine their differences, and that is done through parliamentarism. That's done through bourgeois democracy, wherein they can peacefully just push through taxation, small policy shifts, and stuff like that, while maintaining the basis for bourgeois society to exist. Um, and yes, uh, the, the quote-unquote lefts in Parliament have a tendency to go over to the right, for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, anyway, so... You know, I don't know if I agree with Gorder or Panaclek's, um conception here that the West has some special affinity to bourgeois democracy and therefore the Communist Party must break with it in order to break this conception that some leader who is in parliament is going to lead the workers and gain victories and stuff like that. I, mean, I guess you kind of see it with like FDR and stuff, but that the FDR was put into place more by the unions than anything else, wherein they wanted a short-term solution to um, to the Great Depression, and it was that or revolution. And I suppose right there can be pointed to as an example, right? But that's exceedingly rare, and that was pushed through the unions. That wasn't pushed through by the workers in general. Anyway, back to the text. A great day. It was a historic day, comrade, when on this June day in London, the first Communist Party was founded, and this party rejected the entire structure and governmental apparatus of 700 years. I wish Marx and Engels had been present there. I believed they would have felt a great, a supreme joy in how these English workers rejected the English state, the example for all states on the earth, and, and which for centuries have been the center and stronghold of world capitalism and rules over one third of humanity. How they reject it and its parliament through only theoretically as well as yet. These tactics are all the more necessary in England because English capitalism supports the capitalism of all other countries and will decidedly not scruple to summon auxiliaries from all over the world against every foreign as well as its own proletariat. The fight of the English proletariat, therefore, is a struggle against world capitalism. All the more reason for the English communists to give the most elevated and brilliant example. To wage an exemplary fight on behalf of the world proletariat and to strengthen it by example. Uh, footnote, in England, more ever even than anywhere else, there is always a great danger of opportunism. Thus also our comrade Sylvia Pankhurst, who from temperance, in instinct and experience, not so perhaps from deep sight, but mere chance, was such an excellent champion of left-wing communism, seems to have changed here views. She gives up anti-parliamentarism, and consequently the cornerstone of her fight against opportunism, for the sake of the immediate advantage of unity. By doing so, she follows the road thousands of English laborers have taken before her, the road towards submission to opportunism and all it leads to and finally to the bourgeoisie. This is not to be wondered at. 
but that you, Comrade Lin, should have induced her to do so, should have persuaded her, the only fearless leader of consequence in England. This is a blow for the Russian, for the world revolution. Once I might, once might I ask, once might ask why I defend anti-parliamentarism for England, whereas I, above, I have recommended it only for those countries where the revolution has broken out. The answer must be that in the struggle, it may often prove necessary to go one step so much to the left. If in a country so diseased with opportunism as England, the danger should arise a young communist party falling back into the course of opportunism through parliamentarism is a tactical necessity to defend anti-parliamentarism. And thus in many countries in Western Europe, it may continue to be. Back to the text. Thus, there has to be everywhere one group that draws all the consequences. Such groups are the salt of humanity. Here, however, after this theoretical defense of parliament, anti-parliamentarism, I have to answer in detail your defense of parliamentarism. You defended it from pages 36 to 68 for England and Germany. The argumentation, however, holds good only for Russia, and at the very utmost for a very few other East European countries, not for Western Europe. That, as I said before, is where your mistake lies. That turns you from a Marxist into an opportunist leader. That causes you, the Marxist, radical leader for Russia and probably a few more Eastern European countries, to think back into opportunism where Western Europe is concerned. And if accepted here, your tactics would lead the entire West to perdition. This I'll prove next in detail in answer to your argumentation. Comrade, on reading your argumentation from page 36 to 68, a recollection can constantly occur to me. Amongst the social patriots, I saw myself once more at Congress of the old social patriotic party of Holland, listening to a speech of Trelestas, a speech in which he depicted the workers the great advantages of the reformist policy, in which he spoke of the workers that were not social democratic yet, and were to be won by compromise, in which he spoke of the alliances that were to be made, only provisionally, of course, with the parties of these workers, and of the rifts, quote-unquote, and in between the bourgeois parties of which we were to make use. In just the same way, in almost, nay, in absolutely the same words, you, Comrade Lenin, speak for us Western Europeans. And I remember how we sat there, far back in the hall, we, the Marxist comrades, very few in number, only four or five, Henrietta Roland Holst, Panaclec, and a few others, Drelessa spoke persuasively and convincingly, just as you do, comrade. And I remember how, in the midst of the thundering applause of the brilliant reformist expositions and the reviling of Marxism, the workers in the hall looked round at the idiots and asses and childish fools, names that Trelesta called at, at the time, almost the same as you call us now, infantile. To all probability, things have just have been practically the same at the Congress of the International at Moscow, when you spoke against the, quote, left Marxists. And his words, just like yours, comrade, were so convincing, so logical, within the compass of his method, at times I myself thought, yes, he is right. Usually, I was one to speak for the opposition, in the years up to 1909 when we were expelled. Shall I tell you what I did, when I began to doubt myself? I had a means that never failed. It was a sentence from the party program. Quote, you shall ever act or speak in such a way that the class consciousness of the workers shall be roused and strengthened. That's a, that's a good thing. Nice. <laughs> and I asked myself, is the class consciousness of the workers roused or not by what the man over there is saying? And then I always knew at once this is not the case, and therefore I was right. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. <laughs> not gonna lie. <laughs> um, you, you know, I just wondered: is is this the most class advantageous thing? And it, it, if it is, then it's right. If it's not, then it's wrong. Simple as, simple as. You know, uh, he's right, but he's he's also he, he's he's right. <laughs> yeah. 
what, what's that meme from uh, uh he, he's out of line but he's right that that's basically that's basically it he's out of line but he's right oh well, <laughs> he's not yet yeah, well yes but actually no it's it, it's uh it's this thing right here <laughs> Anyway, um, it was just the same reading your brochure. I hear your opportunist arguments for cooperation with non-communist parties, with bourgeois elements for compromise, and I am carried away. It all seems so brilliant, clear, and fine, and so logical as well. But then I consider, as I long used to, just one phrase which some time ago, ago I made for myself for a campaign against the communist opportunists is as follows. Is what yonder comrade says the sort of thing that strengthens the will of masses for action, for the revolution, for the real revolution in Western Europe? Yes or no? And with, with regard to your brochure, my head and heart answer at the same time, no. Then I know at once, as surely as one can possibly know anything, that you are wrong. <laughs> same energy. I can recommend this method to all comrades of the left wing. Whenever you want to know, comrades, in the severe struggles ahead of us against the opportunists of all countries, here in Holland they have been waging for the last three years, whether and why you are right, ask yourself this question. Lenin's three arguments. In your opposition to us, comrade, you use only three arguments that constantly recur all throughout your brochure, either separately or combined. They are the following. One. The advantages of parliamentary propaganda for winning the workers and the petite bourgeois element to our side. 2. The advantages of parliamentary action for making use of the, quote, rifts between the parties and for compromises with some of them. 3. The example of Russia, where this propaganda and the compromise work so wonderfully well. Further arguments you have none. I will answer them in turn. To begin with the first argument, propaganda on parliament. This argument is only of very slight importance for the non-communist workers. That is to say, the social democrats, the Christians, and, and other bourgeois elements do not, as a rule, read one word in their papers about our parliamentary speeches. Often these speeches are utterly mutilated. With those, therefore, we achieve nothing. We only get the workers to our meetings, brochures, and newspapers. This is a fair criticism, by the way. Um, and I don't... I think it's important to get somebody on the stage in order to counteract the um, other people, but I don't expect to actually be able to propagandize for communism on a um, on a platform. And the reason is this, especially in, in America. The people who are asking the questions are not um, neutral arbiter. In fact, they are literally private people. The debates aren't even official. They're just something that is socially expected, and they are run by private organizations, private institutions. Um, and as you might be able to tell, they very much favor some candidates and unfavor others. Um, we, we see in the past, and, and you know, this, this isn't necessarily always bad from the perspective of our ends. They will not real they will ridicule and not really give the time of day to um ridiculous people but at the same time that also backfires with trump he was obscene and many people are disgusted and very tired of bourgeois po politics and rejected that and trump offered vulgarity he offered an alternative it wasn't a real alternative but he was honest and people were interested in that um so when the news was ridiculing him and stuff like that that just increased the interest people had i guarantee the same isn't going to be for our end of things and i guarantee you that they will not give us a time of day nor will they do anything but ridicule the position rather than ridicule the the actor right so that's not going to work for us actions speaks louder than words we however 
I too often speak in the name of the KAPD, yet them especially through action. The time of the revolution in which we speak, in all bigger towns and villages, they see us act. They see our strikes, our street fights, our councils. They hear our watchwords. They see our leads. This is the best propaganda, the most convincing. This action, however, is not in Parliament. The non-communist workers, therefore, the small peasants and bourgeois, can be reached quite well also without parliamentary action. Here one part in particular from your brochure, Infantile Disorder, must be refuted. It shows where opportunism is already leading you, comrade. On page 54, you say that the German workers coming in in masses to join the ranks of the Independent Party and not the Communist Party is attributable to the parliamentary action of the independents. The mass of the Berlin workers, therefore, had been as good as converted through the deaths of our comrades Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, through the purposeful strikes and the street fights of the Communists. Only a speech of comrade Levi in Parliament was lacking as yet. Had he but delivered this speech, they would have come to us and said to the double-minded independents, no, comrade, this is not true. They've gone to the double minds first because they were afraid as yet of the single minded, the revolution. Because the transition from slavery to freedom lies through hesitation. That doesn't actually argue against what Lenin is saying at all. This isn't an argument against what Lenin is saying. <laughs> Then it is saying that, hey, look, if you had actually been involved, then these people would have come to you instead of to the independents, but you decide not to be involved. And then the response is, oh, well, they weren't ready for it. They, they weren't ready for the revolution yet. So, uh, okay, that doesn't actually address Lenin's point. This isn't a good argument. Anyway. Look out, comrade. You see whether opportunism is already leading you. Your first argument is of no importance. Now, if we consider parliamentary action in a revolution in Germany and England and all Western Europe, reinforces the workers' ideas that leaders will do things for them, and dissuades them of the, from the idea that they must do everything for themselves, we see that this argument does not, bring, not only bring no good at all, but is actually exceedingly harmful. The second argument the advantage of parliamentary action in revolutionary periods for taking advantage of the rifts between the parties and for some compromises with them. An uncongenial task. To refute this argument, especially for England and Germany, but also for all Western Europe, I shall have to go somewhat more into detail than with the first. It is most uncongenial to me, comrade, that I should have to do this against you. His entire question of revolutionary opportunism, for is no longer reformist, but revolutionary opportunism, is a vital question, literally a matter of life and death for us West Europeans. The matter itself, the refutation, is easy. We have refuted this argument a hundred times. When Prolessa, Henderson, Bernstein, Legion, Rinalde, Vanderwild, etc., all the social patriots used it. Why Kautsky, when he was still Kautsky, has refuted it. It was the greatest argument of the reformers. We did not think that we would ever have to do it against you. Now we have to. Well then. The advantage of profiting in Parliament from the, quote, rifts is utterly insignificant. For the very reason that for several years, for a score of these years, these rifts, quote unquote, have been insignificant. Those between the big bourgeoisie, and of pay bourgeois parties. In Western Europe, in Germany, and England, this does not date from the revolution. It was so long before in the period of peaceful evolution. All parties, including the pay bourgeois and small peasants, have been against the workers for a long time already, and between themselves the differences in matters concerning the workers, and consequently on nearly all points, had become very slight, or had not often quite disappeared. This is an established fact, theoretically as well as practically, in Western Europe, in Germany, and England. Theoretically, because capital concentrates in banks and trusts and monopolies to an enormous degree. In Western Europe, and especially in England and Germany, these banks, trusts, and cartels have assimilated nearly all capital in the industries, commerce, transport, and to a great extent even in agriculture. The whole of industry, including small-scale industry, the whole of transport, including small enterprises, the whole of commerce, big as small, small, 
the greater part of agriculture, big and small, has consequently become absolutely dependent on big capital. They have fused with it. Comrade Lenin says that small commerce, transport, industry, and agriculture waver between capital and workers. This is wrong. It was so in Russia, and it used to be so here. In Western Europe, in Germany, and England, they are now so largely, so utterly dependent on big capital that they no longer waver. The small shop owner, the small industrialist, the small trader are absolutely in the power of the trusts, the monopolies, the banks. It is from these that they get their goods and credit, and even the small peasant, through his cooperative and his mortgages, is dependent on the trust, the monopoly, and the banks. Comrade, this part of my argumentation, the argumentation of the, quote, left wing, is the most important of all. The entire tactics of Europe and America depend on it. What elements do they consist of, comrade? These lower layers that stand near their proletariat, of shop owners, artisans, lower officials, and employees, and poor peasants. Let's consider what these are in Western Europe. Follow me, comrade. Not only in the big shop, there the dependence on capital is a matter of course, but also in a small, poor proletarian quarter. Look around you. What do you see? Everything. Nearly all the goods, clothes, foodstuffs, implements, fuels, etc., are the product not only of big industry, but often of the trusts. Not only in the cities, but in the country like side. Though small shopkeepers are for the most part storekeepers of big capital, that is to say banking capital, for this rules the large factories and trusts. Look about you in the workshop of a small arson, no matter whether in the city or in the country. His raw materials, the metals, the leather, the wood, etc. come from him come to him from big capital often even from the monopolies, that is to say, from the banks as well. And so far as the purveyors are small capital says yet, these in turn depend on banking capital, and the lower officials' employees. The great majority of them in Western Europe is in the employment of big capital, the state, of the municipality, finally, therefore, also of the banks. The greatest percent, the percentage of employees and officials near the proletariat that are directly or indirectly dependent on big capital is a very great in Western Europe. In Germany and England, as well as in the United States and the British colonies, is enormous. And the interests of these layers are one, therefore, with those of big capital, that is to say, the banks. I have already dealt with the poor peasants, as we have seen that for the time being they cannot be one for communism, for reasons already mentioned, and also because they are dependent on big capital for their implements, goods, and mortgages. All right, so I understand where he's going with this. I don't know if I strictly agree, especially given the time frame. Um, right, so one of the main things with bank capital is that it is about loans. It's about... Um, the fact that the bank actually owns a lot of these things, the land, the implements, and, and, and so on and so forth. So yes, all these enterprises are indeed dependent on the banking capital. But what is it that people hate more, all these pay bourgeois hate more than anything? They hate the landlord. They hate the people that own their capital that they're working off of. These pay bourgeois um hate the fact that they have to pay off these very expensive loans. We have Susglass on our server who complains about this near incessantly. He's like, oh well, you know, the state is making it so uh it's so expensive to start a business and stuff like that. Well that's bank capital right there. And yeah, people tend to blame the state because bank capital happens to con control, you know, our, all of our news, and they just blame the state for it all. And those pesky uh, things that are protecting you from having to pay too much weren't there, then you could actually um, have to pay less or something. I'm, I'm not too clear about the way that they come to this conception of the world, but you know, that, that's just the way it goes, <laughs> you know. Gosh, it's really annoying. Um, but yeah, so the question is, 
in my mind whether or not these people can actually figure out who it is that's holding the bag um or rather than who is it holding the bag who's actually the one that's fleecing them and the obvious answer is bank capital um and you know realistically the um these bay bourgeoisie should be quite hateful of this bank capital Fortunately, that also tends to emerge out into anti-Semitism and stuff like that. As usual, they just blame anything except for the thing that actually is the case. Um, but that's, we, we all know that. So, I don't know how much I agree with this. Um, I understand where he's going with it. He's basically saying because these are all dependent on it, they can at any time be crushed by the bank capital. Entirely valid. But I think that his belief that um, there are no rifts is incorrect. It's it's just the rifts don't really matter at this current stage of struggle, <laughs> right? Continuing, what does this prove, comrade? That modern West European and American society and state have become one big. Thoroughly organized whole, which is entirely controlled, moved, and regulated by banking capital. The society here is a regulated, regulated body, capitalistically regulated, but regulated all the same. That banking capital is the blood flowing through the entire body and nourishing all its branches. That this body is one, and the capital renders this entire body enormously strong. Therefore, all members will stand by to the very end, all except for the proletariat which makes us blood, surplus value. Through this dependence of all classes on banking capital and through the enormous strength of banking capital, all the classes are hostile to a revolution, so the proletariat stands alone. And as banking capital is the most pliable and elastic force in the world and increases its power a thousand times through its credit, it upholds and maintains capitalism and thus the capital state, even after this terrible war. After the loss of thousands of billions and midst of conditions that seem like bankruptcy to us. And it is through this that, with all the more force, it collects all classes around it, combining them into one whole against the proletariat. And the force and pliability and the unison of all classes are so great that they will last long after a revolution has been broken out. Cause of Revolution's Delay It is true that capital has been terribly weakened. The crisis is coming, and with it, the revolution. And I believe that the revolution will win. But there are two things that will keep capitalism very strong. The spiritual slavery of the masses and banking capital. Our tactics, therefore, have to be based on the power of these two things. And there is one other cause through which I, which organized banking capital still rallies all the classes against the revolution is the great number of proletarians. All the classes feel that if only they could induce the workers, in Germany alone almost 20 million, to work 10, 12, or 14 hours a day, then there would be a way out of the crisis. That is why they hold together. These are the economic conditions in Western Europe. Actually, I want to take this. This is a useful quotation. Um, <clears throat> in Russia, banking capital did not have this power yet, so there the bourgeoisie and the lower classes did not unite. Consequently, there were real rifts between them, and there the proletariat did not stand alone. These economic causes determine politics. It is through this that these, those classes in Western Europe, dependent slaves that they are, vote for their masters, for these big capitalist parties, and that they belong to them. In Germany and England, in Western Europe, these elements have hardly any parties of their own. All this was very strong already before the revolution and before the war. Now through the war it has become intensified to an enormous extent through nationalism and chauvinism, but especially through the massive trustification of all economic forces. Through the revolution, however, this tendency, 
unity of all bourgeois parties with all paid bourgeois elements and all poor peasants, has again been immensely strengthened. The Russian Revolution has not been in vain. Now we know what to expect everywhere. Thus in Western Europe, and especially in England and Germany, the big bourgeoisie and the big peasants, the middle classes and the middle peasants, the lower bourgeoisie and the small peasants, are all united against the workers through monopoly, the banks, the trusts, through imperialism, the war, and revolution. Footnote. Um, it's true that through the war, an infinitely greater number of various elements has come down to the ranks of the proletariat. All elements, though as good as any element that is not proletarian, cling desperately to capitalism and, if need be, will defend it by armed force, being hostile to communism. Back to the text. And as the labor question encompasses all things, they are united on all questions. Here, comrade, I must make the same remark I have already made in the first chapter, with regard to the peasant question. I know quite well what the low minds in our party that led the strength to base tactics on great general lines and consequently base them on small particular ones, that these little minds will call the attention to those elements among these layers that have not yet come under the banner of big capital. I do not deny that there are such elements, but I maintain that the general truth, the general tendency in Western Europe, is that they are under the big banner of big capital. And it is on this general truth that our tactics must be based. Neither do I deny that there may be, quote, rifts yet. I only say that the general tendency is, and will be, for the time, for a long time after the revolution, the unity of these classes. I say that for the workers in Western Europe, it is better to have their attention directed to that unity than to those rifts. For it is they themselves that must in the first place make the revolution, not their leaders, their members of parliament. I disagree with this on a tactical level. Divide and conquer is the watchword for the strategy. You shouldn't look for unity. You should look for the cracks. Appear strong where you're weak, weak where you're strong. I, I mean, this 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 is not a tactical decision here, right? You're always wanting to try to find places where you can break off groups from the ma main mass so that you can make it more manageable. So you can maneuver, so that you can force the enemy force to maneuver in ways that are good for you. This, this isn't tactics, it's not strategy. Um, I understand what he's saying. He's saying, hey, look, these guys, when push comes to shove, they will align together and we need to remind the workers of that. But I think that every worker is going to be cognizant of that to at least some degree. They're, they're going to be, and that can be educated, right? Yeah. Consider the petite bourgeois. We all recognize that the petite bourgeois will necessarily, ultimately, be generally on the side of the big bourgeoisie because of their shared class interests. They both have interests in owing, owning the means of production. However, the petite bourgeoisie also is against the big bourgeoisie and can be, under good circumstances, brought over to the side of the proletariat and then educated from there and inoculated against, uh, um, against bourgeois consciousness. It's, it's not going to work by and large, but it's important all the same. And if all you're doing is looking at their shared class interests and not looking at the, the separate class interests that are internal to that shared class interest, then you're missing something very, very important, the chinks in the armor. So I, I strongly disagree with this on a tactical and strategic level. Okay. Uh, nor do I say that, which little minds uh, will make of uh, my words, that the real interests of these classes are the same as those of big, uh, big capital. I know that these classes are oppressed by it. What I say is simply this. The classes cling to big capital even firmly, more firmly than before, because now they see the danger of the proletarian revolution ahead. In Western Europe, the domination of capital means to them a more or less sure existence, the possibility of or at least a belief in the betterment of their position. 
Now they are threatened by chaos and re the revolution, which for some time to come means worse chaos. That is why they side with capital in the effort to sweep chaos away by every possible means, to save production, to drive the workers for, to work for longer hours, and to endure privation patiently. For them, the proletarian revolution in Western Europe is the fall and breakdown of all order, of all security in existence, be it ever so insufficient. Therefore, they all in support big capital, and will continue to do so for a long time, including during the revolution. All classes fight the proletariat. For finally, I must yet point out that what I have said applies to the tactics at the beginning and in the course of the revolution. I know that quite at the end of the revolution, when victory draws near and capitalism has been shattered, these classes will come to us. But we must determine our tactics not for the end, but for the beginning and in the course of the revolution. Theoretically, all this is, had to be so. Theoretically, these classes had to cooperate. Theoretically, this is an established fact, but practically as well. For I, I will prove next, for many years already, the entire bourgeoisie, all bourgeois parties in Western Europe, also those that belong to the small peasants and the middle bourgeoisie, have done nothing for the workers. And they were all of them hostile to the labor movement and in favor of imperialism, in favor of the war. For years already there had not been a single party in England, in Germany, in Western Europe that supported the workers. All were opposed to them in all that matters. Footnote. I like the space here to point uh, this out in detail. I will have done so at length in a brochure entitled The Basis of I've done so at length in a brochure entitled The Basis of Communism. Back to the text. There was no new labor legislation. Conditions grew worse instead. Laws were passed against going on strike. Even higher taxes were levied. Imperialism, colonialism, Marinism, and militarism were supported by all bourgeois, including the pay bourgeois parties. The difference between liberal and clerical, conservative and progressive, big and petty bourgeois, disappeared. Everything which the social patriots and reformers said about the difference between the parties, about the, quote, rifts between them, was a fraud. And all this has now been brought forward by you, Comrade Lenin. It is a fraud for all countries in Western Europe. This has been best proved in July to August 1914. At that time, they were all one, and the revolution had made, has made them even uh, far more united in practice, against the revolution, and consequently against all workers. For the revolution alone can bring actual betterment to all workers. Against the revolution, they all send together with a, without a single, quote, rift. And as through the war, the crisis, and the revolution, all social and political questions have come to be connected in practice with the question of the revolution. These classes in Western Europe stand together in all questions and opposition to the proletariat. In a word, the trust, the monopoly, the big banks, imperialism, the war, the revolution, have in practice riveted together into one class all the Western European big and pay bourgeoisie with peasant parties against the workers. Footnote. We Dutchmen know this only too well. We have seen the, quote, rifts disappear before our eyes in our small, but through our colonies, highly imperialist country. With us, there are... There are no longer Democrat, Christian, or other parties. Even a Dutch can judge us better than a Russian who, I regret to say, seems to judge Western Europe after Russia. Back to the text. Theoretically and practically, therefore, this is an established fact. In the revolution in Western Europe, and especially in England and Germany, there are no, quote, rifts of any considerable importance between these classes. Here again, I must add something personal. On pages 40 and 41, you criticize Amsterdam Bureau. You cite a thesis of the Bureau. Parenthetically, you say what you say with regard to this is wrong, all of it. But you also say that the Amsterdam Commission, before condemning parliamentarism, ought to have given an analysis of the class relations and the political parties to justify this condemnation. Excuse me, comrade, this is not the task of the Commission. For that on which her thesis is based, to wit all the bourgeois parties in Parliament as well as more outside, had been all along, or even now, opposed to the workers. And it did not show the size, quote, rift, 
all this had been ascertained long ago and was a sash fact for all Marxists. In Western Europe, at any rate, there is no need for us to analyze that. On the contrary, considering you strive for compromise and alliances in Parliament, which would lead us into opportunism, it was your duty to demonstrate that there are any rifts of importance between the bourgeois parties. You wish to lead us, here in Western Europe, into compromising. But Troesta, Henderson, Scheidemann, Tarati, etc. could not accomplish in the time of evolution. You wish to do so during the revolution. It is for you to prove that this can be done. Opposing capitalist forces unite to defeat revolution. And this not by means of Russian examples, these are easy enough to be sure, but with West European examples. This duty you have fulfilled in the most miserable way. No wonder you took almost exclusively your Russian experience out of a very backward country, not the Western Europe of the modern days. In the entire booklet, in the parts which deal with the very question of tactics, the Russian examples accepted, to which I will soon proceed, I can find but two examples from Western Europe, the Kapush in Germany and the Lloyd George Churchill government in England, with the opposition of Askeith. Very few examples indeed, and of the poorest quality, that there are, quote, rifts between the bourgeoisie, and in this case also the social democratic parties. If ever proof was need that between the bourgeoisie, and in this case also the social democratic parties, that there are no important rifts as regards the workers in the revolution and here in Western Europe, the cop push furnishes that proof. The Kapites did not punish, kill, or imprison the Democrats, the Zentrum people, the social democrats. And then when these came into power again, they did not punish, kill, or imprison the Kapites. But both parties killed the communists. This is uh, very much uh, in line with recent events in America, for example. I say recent, but we can point to many other stuff as well. Communism was too weak as yet. This is why they did not together forge a dictatorship. Next time, when communism will be stronger, they will organize a dictatorship between them. As in the um, varying... Um, anti-worker parties, which are all liberal parties, uh, they will organize a dictatorship against communism between the two of them, which is exactly what happened, I think. <laughs> right? Um, anyway. It was and is your duty, comrade, to point out in what way the communists could at the time have taken advantage in Parliament of that rift, in such a way, of course, as to benefit the workers. It was and is your duty to tell us what the communist members of parliament ought to have said to make the workers see it or script and to take advantage of it. In such a way, of course, as not to strengthen the bourgeois parties. You cannot do this because during the revolution there is no rift of any importance. And it is of the time of revolution we speak. It was your duty to point out that if in special cases there should be such rifts, it would be more advantageous to direct the attention of the workers in that direction into the general tendency towards unity. And it was and is your duty, comrade, before leading us, beginning to lead us in Western Europe, to show where the, those threats are in England, in Germany, in Western Europe. This you cannot do either. You speak of a rift between Churchill, Lloyd George, and Askeith, of which the workers are to take advantage. This is altogether pitiful. I will not even discuss this with you. For everyone knows that since in England the industrial proletariat has made some power, these rifts have been artificially made by the bourgeois parties and leaders and are yet to be made to mislead the workers, to entice them from one side to the other, and back again, ad infinitum, thus to keep them forever powerless and dependent. Yeah, <laughs> we know that feeling. To this end, they even at times admit two opponents to the one government, Lloyd George and Churchill. And Comrade Lenin him lets himself be caught in this trap. That is well nigh a century, century old. He strives to induce the British workers to base their politics on this fraud. At the time of the revolution, the Churchills, Lloyd George, and Askeiths will unite against the revolution, and then you, Comrade, will have betrayed and weakened the English proletariat with an illusion 
It was your duty to point out not only by means of general, fine, and brilliant figures of speech, as in the last, entire last chapter on page 72, for instance, but accurately, concretely, by means of clear examples and facts, what those conflicts and differences are, not the Russian ones, nor what those that are of no importance or artificially made, but by means of actual important West European examples. This you do nowhere in your brochure. As long as you do not give these, we do not believe you. When you give them, we will answer you. Until then, we will say, it is nothing but illusions that mislead the workers and lead them to false tactics. The truth is, comrade, that you wrongly assume that West European and Russian revolutions to be alike. And for what reason? Because you forget that in the modern, that is to say the West European and North American states, there is a power that stands above the various kinds of capitalists, the landowners, industrial magnates, and merchants' banking power. This power, which is identical with imperialism, unites all capitalists, including the small peasants and bourgeois. This is a good part right here. Okay, one thing, however, remains to you. You say that there are rifts between labor parties and the bourgeois parties, and that these can be made use of. That is right. We might aver, to be sure, that these differences between the social democrats and the bourgeois in the war and the revolution have been very slight and have disappeared in most cases. But they might be there. And they might arise yet. Of those we must therefore speak, especially as you put it in the, quote, pure English labor government. Thomas, Henderson, Kleins, etc., in England, against Sylvia Pankhurst, Sylvia Pankhurst and the possibly, quote, pure socialist government of Ebert, Scheidemann, Nusk, Hilferding, Crispian, Cohn, and others of, against the KPD. Footnote. Is yet the question whether these, quote, pure labor governments will come here. Maybe... That here, again, you let yourself be misled by the Russian example, Kerensky. Later in this letter, I will point out why, in this case, in the March days of Germany, this, quote, pure socialist government was not to be supported all the same. Back to the text. You say that your tactics, which direct the workers' attention towards these labor governments, encourage them to promote their formation, are clear and effective, whilst ours, which are opposed to their formation, are harmful. No, comrade. Our attitude with regard to these cases of, quote, pure labor government, where the rift between these parties of workers and those of the bourgeoisie became a split, is again quite clear and profitable to the revolution. It is possible that we shall allow such a government to exist. It can be necessary. It can be, mean progress for the movement. If this is so, we cannot proceed any further yet. We will let exist, criticizing them as keenly as possible, and replace them by a communist government as soon as we can. But to promote its arrival in Parliament and in elections, this will not do in Western Europe. And we will not do this, because in Western Europe and in the revolution, the workers stand all alone. And that reason, everything. Do you understand this? Everything here depends on their will for action, on their clearness of brain. And because of these, your tactics of compromising with the Scheidemans and Hendersons, with the Crispians and their followers among the English independents, of the opportunist communists of the Spartacus League or the BSB. Because these tactics, inside and outside Parliament, confuse heads, here in Western Europe and in the Revolution, making the workers elect someone whom they know beforehand to be an imposter, and because our tactics, on the other hand, make them clear-sided, by showing that the enemy as the enemy, and because of all this, even at the risk of losing a representative in Parliament in periods of legality, or missing the benefit of a, quote, rift in Parliament, we in Western Europe, in our to present conditions, choose our tactics and reject yours. Here again, your advice leads to confusion and awakens illusions. But what about the members of the Social Democratic Parties, the German Independents, the Labour Party, and the Independent Party? Must those not be one? These, the working class and pay bourgeois elements among them, will be won by us, the left wing in Western Europe, through our propaganda, 
our meetings and our press, and especially through our example, our slogans, our action on the shop floor. In the revolution, those who are not one thus, through our action, through the revolution, are lost anyway and can go to the devil. These social democratic, independent labor parties in England and Germany consist of workers and pay bourgeois elements. The first, the workers, can all be won in the long run. The pay bourgeois elements only to them to a very slight extent and are of little economic importance. These few will be won over by propaganda, etc. The majority of them, and is on these that Nosk and his conjurers rely above all, belong to capitalism, and in proportion to the revolution's advance, they rally all the closer around it. Alright, there's two bits I want to uh, uh, take. Uh, right here. Uh, da -da -da. And right here. Oh, actually, I'll just take the whole thing. So, I want to give my input on this little bit right here. Um, we see a very distinct understanding in the party formation between this and the previous works from the Third International, which talk about the necessity of a minority of people with will and, and whatnot rising up and creating the Communist Party, which acts as a vanguard. This is in rejection of that, uh, it's in rejection of that vanguard. It is saying that there is no minority Rather, we need to be work reaching out to all workers. Any worker who doesn't get on board is lost to capital, right? And can go to the, they're lost anyway and can go to the devil. Um, right. So I'm not entirely certain what it is that they're pushing. They're, they say, okay, propaganda, meetings, press, giving example having effective slogans, which is a form of propaganda. I don't know why that's not uh, embedded with this. Action on the floor shop. Um, right? So, to this, it's a very much larger movement of radical and educated workers rather than a focused, smaller group of people who act as vanguards and with a precise division of labor and so on and so forth that um, build a party that eventually takes advantage of, a, uh, of the revolutionary movement which they have been seeking to bring into fruition. They, well, technically, as they say, the party can't actually create the conditions, but they can essentially lead the workers to recognize the condition and take advantage of it. And then in the midst of it, they arm and they train and so on and so forth, the workers, so that they can take that advantage and lead it to victory themselves. This has a, this has a different view. It's very much educate everybody. Uh, no revolution, no revolutionary minority. All workers and those that don't, then they're they're just outside of it. Okay, continue. Workshop, not parliament, the battleground. But does the fact that we do not support them at the elections imply that we are cut off from the labor parties, the independents, the social democrats, the labor party, etc.? On the contrary. We take alliance with them as much as we can. On every occasion, we summon them for common action, for the strike, the boycott, the revolt, street fight, and especially for the workers' councils, the industrial councils. We seek them everywhere, only not in Parliament as we used to. This in Western Europe belongs to a past epoch, but in the workshop, in the union, and in the street, that is where we would find them. That is where we win them. This is a new practice, succeeding social democratic practice, it is communist practice. Okay, 
we're going to take this. You, comrade, wish to bring the Social Democrats, the Independents, etc., into Parliament in order to show them that they are deceivers. You wish to use Parliament to show that it is of no use. You seek to slyly deceive the workers. You put the rope around their neck to let them hang. We help them to avoid the rope. We do not. We do this because here we are able to do so. You follow the tactics of the peasant races. We those of the industrial races. Um, poor word usage. <laughs> this is no scorn and no mockery. I believe that with you it was the right way. Only you should not, either in the small matter or in the great question of parliamentarism, force on us what is good in Russia, what leads to destruction here. Finally, I have only one remark to make. You say, and you have often upheld it, that in Western Europe the revolution can only begin after these lower classes adjacent to the proletariat have been sufficiently shaken, neutralized, or won over. As I have demonstrated that they cannot be shaken, neutralized, or won over at the beginning of the revolution, this latter, if your statement was correct, would be impossible. This has been told to me over and over again from your side and from also by Comrade Zinoviev. Fortunately, however, here also your observation in the most important questions which determine the revolution is false. It again proves that you see all things exclusively from the East European point of view. I will make that clear in the last chapter. I herewith believe to have proved that your second argument for parliamentarism is, for the most part, an opportunistic fraud, and that with this first back, parliamentarism must now be replaced by some other method of fighting, one that lacks its drawbacks and possesses greater advantage. I recognize that in this one point your tactics can have some advantages. The labor government can produce some good, greater clarity. At legal times, your tactics can be profitable. We recognize that. But just as once we needed to say to the revolutionists and reformists, we prize the development of self-consciousness in the workers above everything, even above small advantages. We now say to you, Lenin and your, quote, right, comrades, we prize above all the ripening of the masses towards will and deed. Hereto all things have been made subservient in Western Europe. We will see who is right, the left, quote unquote, or Lenin. I do not doubt one moment. We will defeat you, as we did Trolesta, Henderson, Renald, and Legion. Okay, we're going to um, take this a little bit. This here is the place to discuss the mutual relation between party, class, and mass in Western Europe. This matter is also of the greatest importance. It importance the power of banking capital and the unity of all great and small bourgeois classes and genders. The relation between party, class, and mass in Western Europe differs widely from that of Russia and, like the unity of the bourgeois classes, is due to the power of banking capital. Our tactics must be directed towards and based on a true understanding of that relationship. Whoever does not understand this relationship cannot understand the tactics for Western Europe. Let us again take Germany as an example, not only because with England it is industrially the most highly developed country, but also because it offers the most developed statistics. As we have often observed already, has a proletariat of about 20 million actual workers, about 14 million industrial, and some 6 million agricultural. What does this mean? That, counting children, non-workers, and the age, this proletariat comprises at least half, and probably more, of the total population of Germany. We have seen, however, that in the revolution the proletariat stands alone, and that the opponents of the proletariat of, a, of the revolution, by virtue in their arms and their organization, even to this day, are so powerful that they can only be conquered by means of the unity of the entire proletariat. And because of banking capital, their power is such that unity alone does not suffice, that a conscious, determined, uni determined unity, a truly communist unity, is needed. Okay, um... We're going to bold that. Two facts, therefore, are certain. The proletariat is very numerous. 
and comprises more than half of the population. And the opposition, in spite of this, is so powerful that the unity of the proletariat, real communist unity, is needed. Thus only capitalism, thus only thus can capitalism be overthrown and the revolution conquer. What follows from these facts? Firstly, that the dictatorship of a party, of a communist party, cannot exist here in Germany as it did in Russia, where a few thousand dominated the proletariat. Here, in order to conquer capital, the dictatorship must be exercised by the class itself, the entire class. Reminder, that was the demand of the Third International, that the party within the dictatorship of the proletariat should conquer power within that dictatorship of the proletariat through the electoral means. Um, putting really communist people who are part of the communist party who um, are completely forward-thinking and dedicated to a revolution in places. They're saying, no, that everybody needs to already be that. There, there shouldn't be a need for the party to be the determining factor about who's really communist. Rather, everybody needs to be educated in this matter. I question the possibility of this. So, footnote, the Russian Communist Party at the time, Yudinich's and Dinikin's attacks, number 13,287 men, not one ten thousandth part of the population of 150 million. Your special weeks of propaganda number by January 20th increased 220,000. Now is no more than 600,000, uh, 52% of which are workers. So basically what they're saying, what he's saying is, right, hey, look, your communist party did not actually develop after you, um, after the revolution. Instead, it, um, had explosive growth and then it stopped having such explosive growth. Actually, no. This is a turn 20,000 to 600,000 within a year because this was written uh, within the, the year. This is in 1920. That, that's a pretty fast growth. <laughs> okay. Um, it is not, we insistently repeat, for any radical, romantic, aesthetic, heroic, or intellectual reason. But for the most simple and concrete fact, one more of fact, one moreover, that is only too much felt by the German proletariat, that a highly organized German monopoly banking capital is so powerful that it unites the entire bourgeoisie. The same cause that unites the entire bourgeoisie makes it necessary that the entire class should exercise its dictatorship. Okay, um... I think that this kind of needs to be discussed in greater detail. Um, if, if we're waiting for every single worker to be educated before, you know, actually making a move, making the move for that matter, then we're not going to get that kind of unity. People won't bet on a, um, people won't bet on a bad horse, right? And it's only through actually taking action and getting wins that people start seeing you as a horse to bet on. So, I think that he's putting the cart before the horse. Okay, continuing. A united proletariat necessary. From the above mentioned causes, there follows secondly, that at the beginning and during the course of the revolution, the masses are divided into two hostile camps. By masses, we mean the proletariat and the other working class combined. These latter, pay bourgeois, peasants, intellectuals, etc., in the beginning and during the course of the revolution, are hostile to the greater part of the proletariat. Between the proletariat on the one side and the rest of the masses on the other, there is an antithesis. Class and mass in Western Europe are not one, nor can they become so at the start, in the first stages of the revolution. Finally, from the numerical relations of the proletariat above the other classes, from the fact that the proletariat must be united in order to win, there follows, as I have shown above, that the relative importance of the class, as opposed to the power of the leaders, must be very great, that the power of the leaders, with regard to that of the class, must be small, 
and likewise that in all likelihood in Germany power cannot come into the hands of some few leaders. If we consider the character of German industry, its concentration in great numbers of centers, this goes without saying. How great, how numerous the leadership will be, cannot as yet be ascertained. It can only be stated that it will be extended over a great number of persons. And thus, after Germany, it is in the first place in England, and through a lesser degree, all over Western Europe. And this fact that the entire class must exercise its dictatorship, how does that affect the Communist Party? From this, that fact follows that the task of the Communist Party in Western Europe consists almost exclusively of preparing the class and making it conscious for the revolution and the dictatorship. All right, um, give me a second here. Um, so, less powerful leadership. Division into the working class and those not of the working class. Uh, okay, we've already got all that. Um, okay, so... We're going to take this. So, in other words, they're saying that it's it's just about educating the workers. This this calls back to my earliest criticisms of the Dutch German left communist movement. Um, I'll hold my tongue for now. In all its action and all its tactics, the party must always bear in mind that the revolution must be made and the dictatorship exercised not by the party alone, but by the class. The task can only be fulfilled if the Communist Party consists of politically truly conscious and convinced revolutionaries, who are ready for the deed, any sacrifice, and all the half-baked and wavering elements are kept off by means of its program, by action, and especially by the very tactics. These are all things that are called for in Lenin's model of the party um, and the party dictatorship, too. Um, so, just wanted to say that. For only thus, only by preserving this purity, the party will be able to make the class truly revolutionary and communist. Through its propaganda, its slogans, and by taking the lead in all actions. The party can take the lead only by all, all, always being always absolutely pure to itself. How large the Communist Party will become through this action cannot be predetermined. We desire, of course, that it may be as big as possible. But the entire tactics and entire struggle can, must be dominated by this principle. Better a thousand members that are good than a hundred thousand that are bad. For these latter cannot accomplish a revolution and the dictatorship of the proletariat. It all depends on the purity and the firmness of the communist power. Party, how far its power will reach, and how much it will influence the masses. All, also the quality of the leaders depend to some degree on its tactics. In other words, Comrade Lin, we must never follow the tactics you followed in 1902 and 3 when you formed a party that has made the revolution. Okay. So basically, keep the party very close, very um, professional, only the very best people. But the party focuses on educating and going on the shop floors and agitating among the workers and the leadership takes a back seat the party is made up of pretty much everybody as leaders um and the party has to be spotless 
again, you know, we do see kind of how this works. And here's here's part of the problem with this theory of the spotless revolutionary organization. Go and tell pro, right? It's so easy for any half-assed effort by the bourgeoisie to just throw tar at the, at any organization they so please. It's so easy. We see it over and 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 over again. <laughs> add in ad infinitum over again at that. So I don't think that you can actually get this a really pure uh, party. I think that even if you do have such a pure party, it will be very easily blackened. And unless you have some way of dealing with such um, crap that gets spewed. And, you know, Lenin did this. His party would go and attack other parties, right? Um, that they determined were threat to the um, revolutionary movement. They, they would go out there and attack on a social basis, on sometimes a physical basis, if I remember correctly. Um, people did do that. I mean, hell, Rosa Luxemburg, um, I have heard, literally gave names to the police of political rivals that were misleading the proletariat, to, to her view. <laughs> right? So, this sort of stuff is, in fact, cutthroat. Um, and that sort of cutthroatness is also, in effect, forced by the conditions of the competition over the workers, because there is a competition going over the workers. He's just gone over the way that the bourgeoisie are fucking with people's heads using parliamentary politics. But that ignores the fact that there are often many communist organizations, many communist parties, all of which who are competing over bringing the workers to their stance, which they believe is the correct one. I don't think that education is enough. I think action is needed. People won't bet on a bad horse. They need example. They need to be shown, hey, this is fucking working. Look what they're doing. They're getting actual results. If I got on board, then I could get as a part of that and so on and so forth. Why is it that so many people in America who we know are communists, there's many people in America that we know are communists, are joining stuff like the DSA and whatnot? Well, it's because there's not a party that they have in their area. Why are people not starting one? Because it's fucking difficult. And also because these people never actually tell you how to structure your party. They just throw principles at you and expect you to figure it out from there, even though party construction is, from their perspective, something that only happens <laughs> once you've already got your party structured. <laughs> so they put you in a catch-22. Um, and that's part of the reason why I'm going to be researching um, cybernetics after this to see if the, we can get some universal organizational structures and principles that we can apply to worker organization. And then we can say, here is your um, format, Then, but it's also super dynamic. So after you've got your basic format, then according to your conditions, it'll just transform from there, right? <laughs> which, which is how it should be, let's be frank. Anyway, Menshevik's tactics would ruin proletariat. All the Social Democrats of Russia at that time were of the opinion that a proletarian organization ought to be created. And they agreed that this organization was to be attained by means of a blind imitation of German social democracy. All this has finally crystallized into the Menshevist Party. The later Menshevists dreamed of building a big labor party, in which the masses would be able to find role road to their action. Such a party would have to accept all those who adopted its program. 
would have to be democratically conducted and it would find its revolutionary means by way of free criticism and free discussion. It was against this alluring image, Comrade Lenin, that you directed all the blows of your criticism, not only because such a party was impossible under czarism and illusion, but mainly because, quote, behind this illusion, there lurked the immense danger of opportunism. The tactics of the Menshevists would mean that the most wavering and hesitant elements would obtain a decisive influence on the party of the proletariat. This you wish to prevent, and that is why you took care of the program. In the well-known first article, and the tactics also, should always be such that this was impossible. Footnote, the quotations are from Radek. Back to the text. As you did then, we of the left wing wish to do now in the Third International. Through our very program and tactics, we wish to chase away all the vast laying and opportunist elements. We only wish to accept the truly communist, truly revolutionary ones. And we wish uh, to carry out truly communist action. And all this exclusively with a view to inspiring the entire class of the communist spirit, preparing it for the revolution and the dictatorship. This latter, the preparation, is of course a process, a process of interaction. Every action, every partial revolution advances a class, brings it near, near to a party. And a stronger class means greater strength for each new struggle, and also for the party. Thus party, a class can come into ever closer contact, and finally they grow into one whole. This, therefore, is our purpose. The party, small or large, does everything in its power to further the ripening of the class for the revolution and the dictatorship, as this class stands alone in the revolution without the help of the peasants. However, there is yet another means to obtain this. Besides the par political party, we have as our weapon the Arbeiter Union, the Workers' Union, based on the industrial organization. What the party is for political action, the union is for economic action. This letter, and then this therefore is our purpose, and then, however, okay. And just as in numerical and class relations for Germany and Western Europe, which I have quoted, clearly demonstrate that the party cannot exercise a dictatorship. So these figures, these relations, this unity of all class, bourgeois classes against the revolution, this inevitable unity of the proletariat against them, and this necessity of the entire class exercising the dictatorship, becoming the most communist, for the most part communist, demonstrating the iron necessity at no trade union, no arbiter union, or industrial league, nor IWU, industrial workers union, or stop Schwartz movement can ever presume to exercise the dictatorship. Now, I, I believe that the idea is that the party eventually brings all the workers into it. This is something that I believe I recall Lenin saying. All the workers eventually become part of the party through education and joining of their own volition. So, you know, I don't know if um, I don't know if this makes sense. Anyway, they both of them. Maybe I'm just reading it wrong. A anyway, they both of them party as well as I buy worker union, each in its own sphere and with every possible mutual support must do all they can to prepare the class. For the time being, party and union are not separate as they yet. More like all trade unions, the union also has to fight for small improvements, and is therefore constantly exposed to opportunist and reformist influences. Only a truly communist party can subordinate everything to a revolution. From the necessity of this development in Western Europe, which has sprung up through the power of banking capital, it is also clearly evident that those who already who are 
already now in the beginning in the course of the revolution which to place the Ibar worker union, the industrial union, industrial organization above the party, or who even wish to abolish the latter are wrong. So maintain the party. But because it's needed to keep all these different groups uh, on the right path. Gradually, as the party grows stronger, as the union grows, as the class becomes more and more communist, as the revolution approaches its goal, class, party, and worker union or industrial union closely approach one another. In the end, the party, the union, and the class are all equivalent, and they're blended into one whole. Finally, of course, the power and unity of all bourgeois classes and the necessary unity of the entire proletariat makes strong centralization and strict discipline in the party as well as the union absolutely necessary. It is the task of the German and English, the West European and American proletariat to combine centralization and discipline with the strictest control of, with power over, the leadership. Okay. Um, for only thus can the West European and American proletariat conquer through the blending of centralization in the leadership and the control of the membership. So this is an interesting... Um, strictest control of with power over the leadership. So basically centralize the leadership and then maintain maximal control over the leadership. It hardly need it need hardly be explained here that also, after the revolution, the dictatorship of the entire class and the communist spirit of the whole proletariat in Western Europe and America are absolutely necessary. From here, the counter-revolution is so powerful that if these two conditions were not fulfilled, if, for instance, a new class of rulers sprung up out of the intellectuals and the bureaucracy, I think that's... that's Rosa Luxemburg was also doing this, just throwing around, oh, the vanguard is a new class. No, it is. It doesn't have a distinct relation to the means of production. What the hell are you talking about? Just, just, just use power disparity or something like that. Anyway, if, for instance, a new class of rulers sprung up out of the intellectuals and bureaucracy, the revolution would soon perish. Now, already, the tactics must be on the lookout to prevent this. Imagine if I were to say that the central planners were... Imagine if I were to say the computers and the central planners represented a new class because they have a different relation to the means of production than the rest of us. No, that's not how that works. Use words the way they are intended, especially as marketing. Come on. Okay, anyway. How different from Russia all this is? How different from Russia, where as a result of the economic conditions, as a result of class relations, and rightly therefore, a handful of people rule the party, where an infinitesimally small party rules the class, a minutely small class the entire nation, where no arbiter union is needed, where the class and the great majority of remaining working masses, the small peasants, were one with the revolution. Whoever fails to understand from the productive and class relations of Western Europe what the relations between the leaders, the party, and the class, and the masses are, does not understand a thing of the revolution in Western Europe, nor of its necessary stipulations. Whoever wishes to conduct the West European revolution according to tactics and by the road of the revolution, Russian revolution, is not qualified to lead it. Um, Lemonade says, I think a party should organize various things like mutual aid programs, clinics, food pantry, etc. to engage materially with the workers and community. 
identify material needs, things like shelter, food, water, etc. to gain the trust of the masses first. Then you can start educating. I think that you are to a good degree right, but remember, well, okay, you're correct. The goal is always that if you're just doing mutual aid and that's it, then you're a charity outlet. And rather, you need to be an educational outlet. You need to, um, if you're doing that, it needs to be with a specific purpose. And in addition, it also robs power from the bourgeoisie in the sense that one of the things that we need to be doing is teaching the workers not to trust such bourgeois institutions as charitable um, nonprofits and crap like that. Um, as we've seen time and time again, nonprofits and other charitable organizations are ultimately not trustworthy. Um, it's just by the design. Uh, the YouTuber Another Slice has a wonderful YouTube series on it. Um, and I believe Lennon speaks about it um, elsewhere. We've got notes on it somewhere in here. Anyway, continuing. The left-wing tactics. From these Western European and to some extent also from the American and co Anglo-colonial relations, it is therefore perfectly obvious that there is only one kind of tactics that in Western Europe and North America can lead to victory. And these are the tactics of the left wing, in the name of which I speak. For these claims that the leader shall have relatively little power in relation to the class, and the class shall have relatively far greater power. They say for the time being that the class and the rest of the masses cannot be won. They claim that the entire class shall become truly communist, through truly communist propaganda, and therefore the party and the class shall become one. These, in order to obtain the end, wish to destroy the bourgeois trade unions the, and replace them by communist industrial organizations, thus making these organizations substitute for the trade, trade unions, the greatest of class organizations. In Germany, they number 10 million proletarians already, equal to a class. They are against parliamentarism, thus making every worker, and consequently the entire proletariat, independently revolutionary, which is to say communist. They, the left party, act in perfect accordance, therefore with class relations as they really are in Western Europe. They are entirely in the right against the Executive Committee, the Congress of the Third International, and thus you, Comrade Lenin. Only quite recently you said to a British delegation that in England a quite small communist party would be able to accomplish a revolution. Here again you speak as a Russian, and judge things by the Russian example. It is on such mistaken notions that the tactics of the executive and international are based. Footnote. I point out here the contradiction between this opinion and the efforts of winning millions of wavering elements to the third international. This contradiction is another proof of the opportunism of your tactics. Those, however, do think and say and propagate these views do not understand the class relations in Western Europe and North America. But note, uh, a very strong proof of how the board and third international judges all things from the Russian standpoint is the following. After the German Revolution had been beaten down, after the Bavarian and Hungarian Revolutions had been crushed, Moscow said to the German and Hungarian proletariat, Be comforted and bear up. For in March and July 1917 we were also defeated, but in November we won. As it went with us, it will go with you. And to be sure, this time again Moscow is saying the same thing to Czechoslovakian workers. But the Russians won in November exclusively before because the poor peasants no longer support Kerensky. Where executive committee are the millions of poor peasants in Germany, Bavaria, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia? There are none. Your words are just utter nonsense. The perniciousness of these Moscow tactics, however, does not lie solely in that they console the workers by means of false image but more especially in the fact that they failed to draw the right conclusion from the defeat in Germany, Bavaria, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia. The lesson they teach is this. Destroy your trade unions and form industrial unions, thus rendering your party and your class strong internally. 
Instead of this lesson, however, we only hear, it will go with you as it did with us. Is it not high time that, against these Moscow tactics, there should arise all over Western Europe one firmly organized iron opposition? It is a question of life and death for the world revolution itself, and also for the Russian revolution. Um, I want to take this because this is a summary of all the previous things that were being said. To these observations, I need only add that where I speak of the unity of party and class as attained at last, and of the possibility of the entire proletariat in Western Europe and communist America becoming communist, I mean unity as big as possible and a large part of the proletariat. I represent total unity and the entire proletariat as the ideal, as a goal achieved which we must tend, as the aim of our tactics. In all probability, it will be imposed impossible and unnecessary to completely achieve it. But the unity of party and class, and the portion of the proletariat that has to be communist, are so immeasurably greater here than in Russia, that this ideal and the tactics must be brought to the fore. But note, with regard to this, we must bear in mind that we are always speaking of a disarmed proletariat. If through some reason or other, through a new war or later on in the course of the revolution, the proletariat should once more obtain arms, the above-mentioned conditions do not count. Okay, um, well, America's pretty well armed. Maybe not the working class so much. Uh, there's a lot of petite bourgeois gun ownership. It's quite expensive to own guns and especially to be trained with it. But there are many, many guns. They're effectively cheap. Mm. So, so, you know, that was the case back in the 1920s for America, too. So I'm not sure why he's speaking about America as if that's somehow distinct. Um, or put, putting in the same thread, right? Because if it isn't, then, you know, why is he lumping it in? How many guns in America in 1920s? Huh. Greater regulation. Yeah, that was 1934. What about before 1934? Why do you say 1920s if you just talked about the 30s? All right, let's see. So lots of sale. Prohibition, yep. Think about all the mafias and stuff. It's not until a decade later that they got uh, the National Firearms Act. So yeah, there should have been plenty of guns in America, plenty of weaponry, so... I don't know why he's bringing America in this argument if it rests on the claim that a disarmed proletariat must have all these things. But an armed proletariat doesn't need them. Yeah, so, I don't know. Anyway, continuing. Lenin's third argument. Next, I come to your third argument, your the Russian examples. You mentioned them repeatedly. On page 6 to 9, they occur several times. I have read them with the greatest attention, and as I admired them before, I do now. I have been on your side ever since, since 1903. Also, when I did not know your motives as yet, the connections being cut off. As at the time of the Breslatovsky 
peace, I defended you with your own motives. Your tactics are certainly brilliant for Russia, and it is owing to these tactics that the Russians have triumphed. But what does this prove for Western Europe? Nothing, according to my idea, or very little. The Soviets, the dictatorship of the proletariat, the methods for the revolution and the reconstruction, all this we accept. Also, your international tactics have been, so far at least, exemplary. But for your tactics, for the countries of Western Europe, it is different, and it is only natural. Also, sorry, I'm interrupting again, but a lot of these tactics rest on the claim that the proletariat is alone, while all these other classes, the petit bourgeois, the peasant, the big peasant, and the various uh, big bourgeoisie, and so on and so forth, are aligned. But, you know, the peasantry isn't really a thing anymore. And I think that we can agree that the petite bourgeois and the bourgeoisie are very much in line in America. But there aren't, for the masses, 90% of people, maybe 85% of people. Let's, let's be generous and cut out all the managers. 80% of the population of actual people who are of age to do anything our working class, our proletariat, right? We're not facing a united class that ends up being a majority or near majority over the proletariat. It's the exact opposite. The proletariat is the vast, 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 vast majority. So if this is the argument, then things should have qualitatively changed from this, and this should no longer be so applicable. Or it's applicable in other ways. I'm not sure. We'll have to see if there's anything more modern that's looking at the development of the proletariat as a class um, in terms of actual mass numbers um, to make determinations here. Anyway. How could the tactics in the East and West of Europe possibly be the same? Russia, a chiefly agricultural country, but with an industrial capitalism that was only partially highly developed, and a very small compared to the land, and moreover, fed to a large extent by foreign capital. In Western Europe, and especially in England and Germany, is just the opposite. With you, still all fashion forms of capital, from usury capital upwards. With us almost exclusively a highly developed banking capital. And the reason why banking capital is brought up in particular in regards to the workers is people can go in and take things on loan. You need a car, you get a loan. So simply through this banking capital loan relation, it quiets down a lot of the struggle. Um, it's paid in the future, right? And also, you know, loans and stuff act as strict controls over other people. Um, very strict controls. Um, because people are drawn into the political arena to try and fight for reduction and stuff. Consider, for example, student, um, uh, college loans and the fight therein. And how and how hard people fight to try and get those loans forgiven, and it's turned into a political circus, it's turned into a political focus. The bourgeoisie can't actually give that up because it will then light, lighten the grip over these workers significantly. Anyway, um... With you, immense remains of feudal and pre-feudal times, and even from the times of tribe, of barbarism. With us, and especially in England and Germany, all things, agriculture, commerce, transport, industry, under the denomination of the most developed capitalism. With you, immense remains of serfdom, the poor peasants, and in the country of a declining middle class. With us. Even the poor peasants in connection with modern production, transport, technique, and exchange. And in the city, as well as in the country, the middle class, including the lower layers, in direct contact with the big capitalists. You still have classes with which the rising proletariat can unite. The very existence of these classes helps. 
The same applies, of course, to the political parties, and with us, nothing of all this. Of course, compromising in all directions, as you so ca captivatingly describe it, even making use of the rifts between the liberals and the landowners, was all right for you. With us, it is impossible. Consequently, the difference in tactics between the East and the West, our tactics fit our conditions. They are just as good as yours were under Russian conditions. I find your Russian examples, especially on pages 12, 13, 26, 27, 37, 40, 51, and 52. But no matter what these examples may mean for the Russian trade union question, page 27, for Western Europe, they mean nothing at all, as here the proletariat needs far stronger weapons. As far as parliamentarism is concerned, your examples are taken from a period where the revolution had not broken out, pages 16, 26, 41, and 51, for instance. And these, therefore, either do not apply to the point in question, or, insofar as you could use the parties of the poor peasants and pay bourgeoisie, they are so different from our conditions here, pages 12, 37, 40, 41, and 51, as to mean nothing to us. But note, to deal with all these Russian examples would be too monotonous. I request the reader to read them all over. You'll see that what I've said above is right. Back to the text. It seems to me, comrade, that your utterly wrong judgment, the utterly mistaken conception of your book, and no less the tactics of the executive in Moscow are to be attributed exclusively to the fact that you do not know enough about the relations over here, or that, rather that you fail to draw the right conclusions from what you know, that you judge things too much from the Russian point of view. This means, however, and it should be emphasized here once again, as the fate of the Western European proletariat, the world proletariat, the world revolution depends on this, that neither you nor the Moscow executive are able to direct the Western, Euro West European and consequently the world revolution as long as you adhere to these tactics. You ask, is it possible that you who wish to reform the world cannot even form a fraction in parliament? Labor Movement in False Grooves We answer this. This book of yours is proof in itself that whoever tries to do the latter is bound to lead the labor movement into false grooves, into ruin. The book deludes the workers of Western Europe by means of illusions of the impossible, compromise of the bourgeois parties and the revolution. It makes them believe in something that does not exist, the possibility of the bourgeois parties being divided in Western Europe, in the revolution. It makes them believe that here a compromise with the social patriots and the wavering elements in Parliament can lead to any good, whereas it brings hardly anything but calamity. Your book leads the West European proletariat back into the morass, from which it costs the greatest efforts it has not yet escaped but is beginning to escape. It leads us back into the morass, which men like Scheidemann, Kleins, Rinalde, Kautsky, MacDonald, Longuet, not Longuet, names, Vanderveld, Branting, and Trelestra have landed us. It must inevitably fill out all these with great joy, the party, bourgeois parties likewise. They understand it. This book is to the communist revolutionary proletariat what Bernstein's book would have been for the pre-revolutionary proletariat. It is the first book of yours that is no good. For Western Europe it is the worst book imaginable. We comrades of the left wing must stand close together must start everything from below upward, and must criticize as keenly as possible all those that in the Third International do not go in the right way. But no, personally, I believe that in countries where the revolution is still far off yet, the workers are not yet strong to make it, parliamentarism can be used. Sharpest criticism of the parliamentary delegates is necessary in that case. Other comrades, I believe, are of a different opinion. I, I just want to say, in the American context, any engagement there is predicated on you engaging well in a communist party. There's no like doing a parliamentary nonsense while in the Democratic Party or some nonsense like that. That's not how that works. So don't don't get confused by that. This is solely talking from the perspective of you have a communist party that is engaging in parliament. Solely that. Thus, the conclusion to be drawn from these arguments about parliamentarism is as follows. 
Your three arguments for parliamentarism mean very little or you are wrong and is in the trade union question. Your tactics also on this point are disastrous for a proletariat. And with these mistaken or insignificant motives, you hide the fact that you bring hundreds of thousands of opportunists into the Third International. And part four, opportunism in the Third International. The question of opportunism in our own ranks is such an immense weight that I must deal with at more length. Comrade, with the establishment of the Third International, opportunism has not died in our ranks either. We see in all communist parties in all countries. Also, it would be truly miraculous and against all laws of development if that which killed the Second International did not live in the Third. On the contrary, just as the fight between anarchism and social democracy was fought in the Second International, that between opportunism and revolutionary Marxism will be fought in the Third. This time, again, communists will go into parliaments to become leaders. Trade unions and labor parties will be supported for the sake of votes in the election. Instead of parties being founded for communism, communism will be used to found parties. But parliamentary compromises with social patriots and bourgeois elements will once more come into use, as after the revolution Western Europe is going to be a slow process. Freedom of speech will be suppressed, and all good communists expelled. In a word, all the practice of the Second International will come to life again. The left wing must oppose this. It has to be there to wage this fight, as it was there in the Second International. Here in the left wing must be supported by all Marxists and revolutionaries, even if they are of the opinion that the left wing is mistaken in detail. For opportunism is our greatest enemy, not only, as you say, page 13, outside, but also within our ranks. So I just want to say, as leader of the United Marxist Pact, I don't think I have ever considered banning or silencing somebody on account of them being more left than me. Or more left than the general server um, zeitgeist, right? Um, my position has always been well, we need to continually move leftwards, continually get more revolutionary, continue to get more development there. Um, our tactics need to get refined and in the leftward position. That's always been the case, even when I was what might be called a dingist, right? Um, and under bad circumstances. And that's something that I've always stuck by. Um, so the idea of people kicking people out of an international on the grounds that they're to the left of you in tactics is quite obscene to me. I, I can absolutely see kicking somebody out for being to the right of me on tactics. Um, we, we've kicked people for, for that sort of stuff. Pat patriotic socialist crap. Or is a perfect example of this, but to the left, absolutely not. Um, and that should, in my view, be the case always. And that would necessarily continually lead to a leftward direction, no matter what, right? Just an internal, continual leftward direction. So, anyway. It would be a thousand times worse that opportunism, with its devastating effect on the soul and the strength of the proletariat, should again slip in. That then in the left wing should be too radical. The left wing, even though at times it goes too far, always remains revolutionary. Yes. The left wing will alter its tactics as soon as they are not right. The opportunist right will grow ever more opportunist, will sink ever further into the morass will corrupt the workers to never extent. Not in vain have we learned from 25 years of struggle. Opportunism is the plague of the labor movement, the death of the revolution. Opportunism has brought about all evils, reformism, the war, the defeat and the death of the revolution in Hungary and Germany. Opportunism is the cause of disaster, and it exists in the Third International. What do I need so many words for? Look around you, comrade. Look into yourself and into the executive committee. Look in all countries of Europe. 
this is something that I strongly agree with. I think that this is a powerful statement which should be um, remembered. Feeble criticism. Read the papers of the British Socialist Party, now the Communist Party. Read 10, 20 numbers of this paper. Read the feeble criticism against the trade unions, the Labour Party, the members of Parliament, and compare this to the letter of the left wing. A comparison between these two will show that Utah opportunism is approaching the Third International in immense mass, in immense masses. Once more, through the support of counter-revolutionary workers to obtain power in Parliament. A power of, after the pattern of the Second International. Remember, too, that the USP will enter the Third International and numerous other center parties besides. Do you not believe that if you compel these parties to expel Kautsky, that a swarm of tens of thousands of other opportunists will come? The entire measure of this expulsion is childish. An innumerable stream of opportunists is approaching, especially since your brochure. Footnote, in how in one day alone 500,000 new members came under the leaders, which only a short while before they joined had recognized themselves to be worse than the Scheidemann lot. In our tours, three quarters of the French Socialist Party joined, which until quite recently were for the most part social patriots. Yeah, all the good people are just going to leave if that, if, if that happens. I'll, I'll say that. Um, I can imagine if suddenly we reverse course and started inviting all the Hazites and, and shit like that. People would leave in droves. And then, yeah, we might potentially get more people than we lost, but do we really want those people? No. Absolutely not. Ew. <laughs> Imagine just casual lounge filled with gorillas and suns for days. Continuing. Look at the Dutch Communist Party, once called the Bolshevists of Europe, and rightly so, taking into account the conditions. Read a brochure about the Dutch Party, how utterly already it, had been, it has been corrupted by the opportunism of the Second International. During the war and after it, and even to this day, it has pledged itself to the Entente. Its one brilliant party has become an example of equivoca equivocality and deceit. But look in Germany, comrade. The land where the revolution has started. Their opportunism lives and thrives. We were utterly amazed to hear you defend the attitude of the KPD during the March days. But fortunately, we learned from your brochure that you did not actually know the course of the development. You sanctioned the attitude of the KPD Zentral that offered loyal opposition to Eber, Scheidemann, Hilferding, and Crispian. But you evidently did not know, at the time of writing the brochure, that this happened at the same moment Eber organized troops against the German proletariat, whose general strike was still spread all over Germany, and which the great majority of the communist mass strove to bring to revolution, if not to victory. Perhaps this is par hardly possible as yet. At any rate, to a higher strength. Whilst the mass, by means of strikes and armed revolt, conducted the revolution into a further stage. There has never been anything more hopeful or gigantic than the revolt in the rural region and the general strike. The leaders offered parliamentary compromises. In doing so, they supported Hebert against the revolution in the rural region. But note, Comrade Panoklek, who thoroughly knows Germany, had predicted this. If the leaders of the Spartacus League were placed before the choice between parliament and revolution, they would choose parliament. Um, and Aber was a piece of work. I recommend everybody listen to CCK Philosophy's uh, series on the German Revolution, along with Bestie Marx. They both have wonderful series on that. If ever an example proved how damnable the use of parliamentarism is in the revolution, this is it. You see, comrade, that is parliamentary opportunism, that is compromise of the social patriots and the independents, which we refuse to accept, and which you try to further. And, comrade, what has already become of the industrial councils in Germany? You and the executive of the Third International had advised Kais to unite with all other trends in order to obtain the leadership of the trade unions. And what has happened? The opposite. The industrial centrale has nigh well developed it, 
into an instrument of the trade unions. The trade unions are an octopus, strangling everything living that comes within its reach. Comrade, you read and investigate everything that is done, being done in Germany and Western Europe. I have full confidence that you will come over to our side. Just as I believe that your experiences in the Third International will convert you to our tactics. However, if opportunism proceeds thus in Germany, how will it be in France and England? You see, comrade, these are the leaders we do not want. That is the unity of mass and leader that we do not want. That is the iron discipline, military obedience, and submission and servility that we do not want. Permit us to add here one word to the executive committee, and especially to Rada. The executive committee has had this insolence to demand of the KPD that they should expel Wolfheim and Lochenberg, instead of leaving them to sell this for themselves has threatened the KPD and pandered to the central parties, such as the USB, but did not demand of the Italian party that it should expel the Zentral, which, through its offer, was partly responsible for the murder of communists in the Ruhr region. It did not demand of the Dutch party that it should expel Wijkoop and Van Revistien, who, who during the war offered Dutch ships the Entente. This does not mean to say that I wish myself these comrades to be expelled. On the contrary, I hold them to be good comrades, who have gone wrong only because of the development. The beginning of the West European Revolution is so terribly difficult. We, all of us over here, still make many big mistakes. Moreover, expulsion at present from this international would be of no avail. So, I actually want to cut in here. Um, I was listening to an auxiliary statements podcast on the um, on the support of of reactionary um, uh, they, sorry reactionary national liberation movements and. Um, it was talking about the USSR's relation with, I believe it was Turkey. And what happened was essentially after a group of communists was killed, communist leaders in particular was killed. And of course, Turkey had also done a switcheroo wherein they banned all the communist parties and then they made whole cloth a, a a communist party by name only and then um said oh yes uh, this is the communist party you should join this one it's the legal one um and of course many people were fooled by this and entered into it and it's it's just another bourgeois party and it, it's a labor party of the same vein as um uh, it's a nationalist labor party of the same vein as uh england's Right, and it was designed with the intent purpose of scooping up um, un unthinking and uneducated workers who didn't know any better, and they just realized communism good, right? And um, that ain't a communist party, brother. <laughs> um. Anyway, so when the um. All these Communist Party leaders were murdered. They got disappeared or just slaughtered and stuff like that. And what happened? Did the USSR do anything about it? Did they say, no, you can't kill fucking communists in your country. We're going to do shit to you if you do. You need and protecting the international movement. Instead, they decided that it was more important to maintain international relations with the bourgeois state on the basis that they were anti-imperialist and what is that ultimately that is a message that the ussr will stand by and let you kill your national communists so long as you say that you're anti-imperialist right I, that no <laughs> It's an absolute error of tactics. It's an absolute error of strategy and whatnot, and it ruins any ability for national communist movements to actually take advantage of what the Soviet Union was supposed to be, which is a holding ground. 
It was supposed to be a thing where various communist movements could get support so that they could do their own national revolutionary movements. This is the entire reasoning Stalin had. But was it followed through on? No, it wasn't. Okay, continuing. I only point this out to demonstrate by another example how fierce the opportunism is raging already in our own ranks. For the Moscow Central Committee has committed this injustice against the KVD only. Because for its opportunist world tactics, it did not really want revolutionary elements, but opportunist independence, etc. It has deliberately used the tactics of Wolfheim and Laufenberg against the KVD for the most miserably opportunist of reasons. Although it knew that the KVD would, did not agree with these tactics. Because it wants masses around it, like the trade unions and the political parties, no matter whether these masses are communists or not. Two other reactions of the Third International prove clearly where it is drifting. The first is the expulsion of the Amsterdam Bureau, the only group of revolutionary Marxists and theoreticians in Western Europe that has never wavered. The second section, which is almost more serious, is the treatment of the KPD, the only party in Western Europe which, as an action as a whole, from its very origin outwards, has conducted the revolution as it should be conducted. While the centre parties, the independents, the French and English centre, who always betrayed the revolution, were lured by all possible means, the KPD, the real revolutionaries, were treated as enemies. These are bad signs, comrade. In a second word, it, in a word, the second international is still alive or alive again in our midst, and opportunism leads to ruin. And because this is so, and because opportunism is very strong amongst us, far stronger than I could have ever imagined, the left wing has to be there. Even if there should be no other re good reasons for its existence, it would have to be there as an opposition to counterbalance opportunism. Absolutely agreed. Alas, comrade, if only you had followed the tactic of the left wing and the Third International. Those tactics are nothing but the pure tactics of the Bolshevists in Russia adapted to West European and North American conditions. If only a stipulations and statutes for the Third International you had proposed and carried through economic organization, industrial organization, and workers' unions, into which, if need be, industrial unions on a shop floor basis might have been introduced and political organization parliament parties which reject parliamentarism. Then you would have been in first place, have had, in all countries, absolute firm kernels, parties which could really carry out the revolutions, parties that would gradually have gathered masses around them through their own example in their own country and not through pressure from outside. Then you would have economic organizations that would have annihilated the counter-revolutionary trade unions, syndicalists as well as free. And then with one stroke you have cut off the way for all opportunists. For these can thrive only when, where there is plotting with the counter-revolution. Then likewise, this is by far the most important point. You would have educated the workers into independent fighters to a high, very high degree, as is possible in the present usage. Um, let's take this. If you, Lenin, and you, Bukharin and Radek, had done this, had chosen these tactics, with your authority and experience, you, your strength and genius, and if you had helped us eradicate the faults that cling to us as of yet, to our tactics, and we will have achieved the third international that was perfectly firm internally and unshakable externally. An international which would gradually have gathered the entire proletariat around it, through the force of its example, and which would have built communism. It is true there are no tactics without defeat, but these would have suffered least defeat, and would most easily have recovered from it. They would have gone the quickest way, and would have won the quickest and surest victory. Yours lead to repeated defeat for the proletariat. However, you have rejected this because, instead of conscious, steadfast fighters, you want partly, party, partly, or totally unconscious masses. Part 5. Conclusion Finally, I have to make a few observations regarding our last chapter. Conclusions 
perhaps the most important of your entire book. Again, I was allied with it, as long as I thought of the Russian Revolution. But over and over again, the thought came into my head. The tactics that are brilliant for Russia are bad here. They lead to defeat here. You assert here, comrade, pages 68 to 74, that at a certain stage of development, the masses must be attracted, millions and millions of them. The propaganda for pure communism that collected the avant-garde and educated it suffices no longer at this stage. Now is the time, and follow once again your opportunist methods I have already refuted, taking advantage of, quote, rifts, of pay bourgeois elements, etc. Comrade, this chapter is also completely wrong. You judge as a Russian, non-international communist who knows real West European capitalism. Almost every word of this chapter, wonderful though it may be for the knowledge of your revolution, is wrong for big industrial capitalism, for the trusts and monopoly capitalism. I will demonstrate this here, first in small matters. Still need for propaganda. You write about communism in Western Europe. Quote, the vanguard of the Western European proletariat has been won. Wait, end quote, page 70. This is wrong, comrade. Quote, the period of propaganda is past, end quote, page 69. This is not true. Quote, the proletarian vanguard has been won over ideologically, end quote. This is not so, comrade. This stands in line and proceeds from the same mentality with what I read in Bukharin not long ago. Quote, English capitalism is bankrupt, end quote. I also read in Radix similar fantasies that were closer to astrology than astronomy. Nothing of this is true. Except for Germany, there is no vanguard anywhere yet. Neither in England, nor France, nor Belgium, nor Holland, nor, if I am very well informed, in most of the Scandinavian countries. There are only a few éclairs who do not agree about the course that must be followed. What is an éclair? Oh, a scout. Okay, I see. There are only a few scouts who do not agree yet about the course that must be followed. But note, English communists, for instance, with regard to the most important matter of affiliation, the Labour Party. Quote, the period of propaganda is past, end quote, is a terrible lie. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're never out of, you're, you're never out of your period of propaganda. You're constantly producing um, stuff for developing class consciousness. No, comrade, this period is just beginning in Western Europe. There is no firm kernel anywhere as yet. What we need here is a kernel, hard as steel, clear as glass. And this is where we should begin with here, herewith to build up a big organization. In this respect, we are here in the stage you were in 1903 or even before, in the Iskra period. Comrade, conditions here are far riper than we are. But that is no reason why we should let ourselves be carried away to begin without a kernel. For the time being, we of Western Europe, the communist parties in England, France, Belgium, Holland, Scandinavia, Italy, and even the KPD in Germany, must remain small. Not because we want to, but because otherwise we cannot become strong. An example, Belgium. Except for Hungary, before the revolution, there is no country where the proletariat is as corrupted by reformism as Belgium. If at this moment communism be should become a mass movement there, with parliamentarism, etc., the vultures, the profiteers, etc., of pro opportunism would swoop on down on it immediately and drag it to destruction. It is the same everywhere. For that reason, because the labor movement here is very weak as yet, and almost completely trapped in opportunism, because so far communism is hardly anything, and must fight on the questions of parliamentarism and trade unions and all others, until we gain the highest lucidity and clarity, until everything has been made theoretically as clear as possible. A sect, therefore, says the executive committee. Certainly a sect, if that is what you want to call it, the kernel of a movement that conquers the world. Comrade, there is a time when your movement, the Bolsheviks, was also small and insignificant. It was because it was small and voluntarily remained so for a time that it kept itself pure. And through this, and this exclusively, it became powerful. We also want to proceed in this way. All right. Um, 
So I'll take this demand for a small party that holds purity. Okay. This is a question of the utmost importance. Not only the Western European, but also the Russian Revolution depends on this. Beware, comrade. You know that Napoleon, in trying to spread modern capitalism all over Europe, was finally wrecked and had to make way for reaction when he had arrived. Where there is not only too much of the Middle Ages, but especially too little capitalism. These, your minor assertions, are not true. I will now proceed to the bigger ones, to the most important for all of all you say. That now the time has come without propaganda to win millions for pure communism. Through the opportunist policy you describe. Comrade, even if you're right in the small manners, if the communist parties were actually strong enough, this would be utterly wrong from beginning to end. Pure propaganda for the new communism, as I've often said already, will be necessary here in Western Europe from the beginning of the revolution to the very end. Because this point is of such importance that has to be constantly repeated. It is the workers, the workers alone, who must bring communism. All the other classes, they have nothing to expect in any considerable measure until the revolution is finished. You say, page 72, that the period of the revolution has started in which we had the vanguard, and which, one, all class powers that are against us have become sufficiently disarranged, have fought sufficiently amongst themselves, have been sufficiently weakened by the struggle that surpasses their strength. Two, all vacillating, undecided elements, the pay bourgeois, the pay bourgeois democracy, have been sufficiently unmasked before the people, have exposed themselves sufficiently through their bankruptcy. Well, comrade, this is Russian. In the Russian government body, which is rotten through and through, there the, these were the conditions for the revolution. In the modern, really big capitalist states, however, the conditions will be altogether different. The big bourgeois parties will stand together in opposition to communism, will not get disarranged. And the pay bourgeoisie will stand by them, not in absolute sense, of course, but to such an extent that has to determine our tactics character of West European revolution. In Western Europe, we must expect the revolution as a tenacious struggle on either side, with a firm organization on the part of the bourgeoisie and the pay bourgeoisie. The immense organizations of capitalism and the workers prove this. These, therefore, we have to organize likewise with the very best weapons, the best form of organization, the best and strongest methods of fighting, not with weak ones. It is here, and not in Russia, that the real struggle between capital and labor will be fought, because here there is real capital. Comrade, if you think that, from a ten tendency for theoretical purity, I exaggerate. Just look at Germany. There you have an utterly bankrupt, almost desperate state. But all classes, big and pay bourgeois alike, as well as the peasant classes, stand firmly united against communism. Thus it will be everywhere with us. It is true that just at the end of the development of the revolution, when the most terrible crisis breaks out, when we are quite close to victory, the unity of the bourgeois classes will perhaps disappear, and some of the pay bourgeois and peasants will come to us. But what good is that to us? We must determine our tactics for the beginning and the course of the revolution. Because this is so, and has to be so, because of the class relations, even more the relations of production, the proletariat stands alone. Because it stands alone, it can only thrive if it gains greatly in spiritual strength. And this is the way, only way it can thrive. Propaganda for pure communism is needed here until the very end, quite the contrary to Russia. Without this propaganda, the West European and consequently the Russian proletariat is lost. The same holds true to, of the executive in Moscow. While I was writing the last few pages, the news came through that the international had adopted your tactics and those of the executive. The West European delegates have let themselves be dazzled by the brilliance of the Russian Revolution. All right, we will take up the fight in the Third International. We, comrades, your old friends Panaclek, Roland Holst, Rutgers, and myself, truer than you can, of which you cannot find, on hearing your West European tactics, ask ourselves what could have caused them. Opinions differ greatly. The one said, The economic condition of Russia is so bad after, that, after all, it needs peace. 
For that reason, Comrade Lin wants to gather around him as much power as possible, the Independents, Labor Party, etc., so that they may help him to obtain peace. The other said, he wishes to hasten the general European revolution, therefore millions have to join. That is the reason for his opportunism. I myself believe, as I have said before, that you misunderstand European conditions, the state of things. However this may be, comrade, and from what motives you may act, if you go on with these tactics, you will suffer the most terrible defeat. It will lead the proletariat into the most terrible defeat. For if you wish to save Russia, the Russian Revolution, by means of these tactics, you collect non-communist elements. You join them to us, the real communists, while we have... We do not as yet have a firm kernel. With this medley of dead trade unions, with a mass of half or quarter communists in which there is no solid kernel, you want to fight against the best organized capital in the world, with all the non-proletarian classes on its side. It goes without saying that in the battle this medley will fall apart, and the great mass will take flight. Why German workers must not be defeated. Comrade. A crushing defeat of the German proletarian, for instance, is a signal for a general attack on Russia. Yeah. You wish to make the revolution here with this hodgepodge of Labour Party independence, French Center, and the Italian Party, etc., and with these trade unions, the outcome cannot be otherwise. The governments will not even fear such a load of opportunists. If, however, you form an internally form radical groups, firms, those small parties, Firm, no small parties, then the government will fear these parties, as only these carry away the masses and great deeds in the revolution, as the Spartacus League has proved in the beginning, when the government will have to release Russia, and finally when the parties will thus, through these pure tactics, have grown powerful, victory will be ours. These are, quote, left tactics, therefore are the best, nay, the only ones that bring salvation for us and Russia alike. Your tactics, on the other hand, are Russian. They are excellent in a country where an army of millions of poor peasants stood ready, and where there is a wavering, desperate middle class. Here, they are no good. I must follow your feet your assertion that many of your associates, upon which I have already touched in the third chapter, that the revolution in Western Europe can only begin after the lower democ democratic layers of capitalism have been sufficiently shaken, neutralized, or won. This assertion, also, in one of the most weighty questions about the revolution, proves once more that you consider everything from a purely East European point of view, and this assertion is wrong. For the proletariat in Germany and England is so numerous, so powerful through its organization, that it can make the revolution, its beginning and development without, and in opposition to all these classes. And even that must make the revolution driven by sufferings in Germany. It can only do so if it follows the right tactics. If it founds its organization on a shop floor basis and rejects parliamentarism, but only it strengthens the workers in this way. We of the left wing, therefore, choose our tactics not only for the reason mentioned above, but especially also because the West European proletariat, in the first place the German and English proletariat by itself alone, if only it grows conscious and united, is so immensely strong that it can win in this simple manner. The Russian proletariat had to take roundabout ways, being too weak by itself, had done so brilliantly in a manner far surpassing all the world proletariat has ever achieved. But the West European can all, proletariat can triumph by the straight, clear road. Thus this assertion of yours has been refuted. There remains one argument still here to be refuted, one which I have read over and over again with the right, quote-unquote, communists, which I heard from the Russian trade union leader Lodzovsky, of which, and which is to be found also with you, quote, the crisis will drive the masses to communism, even if we retain the bad trade unions and parliamentarism. This is a very weak argument, for we have no idea how big the crisis is going to be. Will it be as deep in England and France as it is now in Germany? Secondly, in this argument, the mechanical argument of the Third International, has proved how weak it is during the last six years. In Germany, the misery during the last years of the war was terrible. The revolutions did not break out. 
It was terrible in 18, 1918 and 1919. The revolution did not triumph. The crisis in Hungary, Austria, and the Balkans and Poland is terrible. The revolution did not come, or did not win, or didn't, or not even when the Russian armies were quite near. But in the third place, the argument turns against yourself. For the crisis should bring about the revolution in any case, the bare quote left tactics might as well just be adopted. And the reason why the Russian army is being near is because in 1990, right? One would imagine if there was a significant communist movement going on and just waiting for the opportune time, seeing the Red Army right on the horizon, ready to back you up if you need be, would be a wonderful time for that to occur under the spirit of internationalism, right? So why didn't it happen? The examples of Germany, Hungary, Bavaria, Austria, Poland, and the Balkans, however, all prove that crisis and misery do not suffice. They have the most terrible economic crisis, and yet the revolution does not break out. There must be another cause yet, which brings a revolution about, and which, if it does not work, causes the delay or the collapse of a revolution. This cause is the spirit of the masses. And it is your tactics, comrade, which failed to sufficiently awaken the spirit of masses in Western Europe, which does not sufficiently strengthen it. Which leaves it as it were. In the course of writing, I have pointed out that the, that banking capital, the trusts, the monopolies, and the West European and North American state formed by them, dependent on them, as they are, unite all bourgeois classes, big as well as small, into one whole against the revolution. But this force, uniting society and state against the revolution, goes even further. Banking capital itself organized the working class in the previous period, in the period of evolution against the revolution, educating, uniting, and organizing them. In what way? In the trade union, syndicalists as well as free, and in the social democratic parties. By forcing them to fight only for reforms, capital turned these trade unions and labor parties into counter-revolutionary forces for the maintenance of the state and society. Because of big capital, trade unions and labor parties become props of capitalism. As, however, these organizations consist of workers, and almost a majority of workers, and a revolution cannot be made without the workers, these organizations must be destroyed before the revolution can succeed. And how are they to be destroyed? By changing their spirit. Their spirit can only be changed by making the spirit of the members independent to the most, utmost degree. And this can be done only by replacing the trade unions with industrial unions and workers' unions, abolishing parliamentarism and the labor parties. And your tactics prevent this. It is true that German, French, and Italian capitalism is bankrupt, or rather that these capital states are bankrupt. The capitalists themselves, their economic and political organizations, maintain themselves under profits, dividends, and new capital are huge, so huge. Only, however, by extension of the circulation of the paper by the state, printing more money. If the German, French, and Italian states fall, the capitalists fall likewise. Crisis is nearing. The crisis approaches with an iron necessity. The prices rise, strike weights rise as well. If they fall, the army of the unemployed increases. Misery is spreading all over Europe, and hunger is approaching. Moreover, the world is full of new fuel. The conflict, the new revolution, is drawing near. But how will it end? Capitalism is still powerful. Germany, Italy, France, and Eastern Europe are not the whole world. In Western Europe, North America, and the British dominions, for some time to come, capitalism will still hold all classes against the, the proletariat. The issue, therefore, to a very great extent, depends on our tactics and our organization. And your tactics are wrong. Here in Western Europe, there's one, only one kind of tactics. Those of the left wing that tells the proletariat the truth and does not blind it with illusions. Those that, even though it may, may take a long time, forge the only effective weapons. The industrial organizations, uniting these into one whole, and the originally small but pure and firm kernels, the communist parties. 
These tactics, moreover, that spread these organizations over the entire proletariat. This has to be like this, not because we have the left wing want it, but because of relations of production, class relations, demand it. At the conclusion of my exposition, I will draw them up in a concise survey so that the workers may see everything clearly for himself. In the first place, I imagine, there follows from a clear image of the causes of our tactics, clear survey of the motives of our tactics, and the tactics themselves. Banking capital dominates the whole world. Ideologically and materially, it keeps the gigantic proletariat in the deepest slavery and unites all bourgeois classes. Consequently, the gigantic masses must rise and proceed to act for themselves. This is only possible through industrial organizations and the abolition of parliamentarism in the revolution. So, I wonder what the development of banking capital in highly in, in nations that are still semi feudal ish or at least have significant peasant populations like India. Food for thought. Secondly, I will summarize the tactics of the left wing and those of the Third International in a few phrases, so that the difference between your tactics and those of the left wing become clear and absolutely obvious, so that your tactics lead to a great debacle, as they probably will. The workers will not lose courage, but might see that there are other tactics. The Third International believes that the West European Revolution will proceed together according to the laws of the tactics of the Russian Revolution. The left wing believes that the West European Revolution will fall, make and follow its own laws. The Third International believes that the West European Revolution will be able to make compromises and alliances with pay bourgeois and small peasants, and even with big bourgeois parties. The left wing believes that this is impossible. The Third International believes that in Western Europe during the revolution there will be rifts and scissions between the bourgeois, pay bourgeois, and small peasant parties. The left wing believes that the bourgeois and pay bourgeois parties will form one united front until the end of the revolution. The Third International underestimates the power of the West European and North American capital. The left wing makes its tactics conform to this great power. The Third International does not recognize the power of banking capital, the big capital which unites all bourgeois classes. The left wing, on the contrary, bases its tactics on this unifying power. As the Third International does not believe in the fact that in Western Europe the proletariat will stand alone and neglects the mental development of this proletariat, which in every respect is so deeply entangled in bourgeois ideology and chooses tactics which leave slavery and subjection to bourgeois mind ideas unmolested and intact. So we're just going to make this entire thing. It's, it's simply restating things that were already said, but um, that might be helpful. Left-winger to free workers' minds. The left-wing chooses its tactics in such a way that in the first place, the mind of the worker is liberated. As the Third International does not found in its tactics on freeing the mind, nor on the unity of all bourgeois and pay bourgeois parties, but on compromises and rifts, it leaves the old trade unions intact. Trying to unite them with the Third International, as the left wing strives above all for freeing the mind and believes in the unity of the bourgeois parties, it realizes that the trade unions must be destroyed and that the proletariat needs better weapons. The same moves induce the Third International to support parliamentarism. The same moves also induce the left wing to abolish parliamentarism. The Third International leaves the condition of slavery such as it was in the Second. The left wishes to change it from below upward. It seizes the evil at the root. As the Third International does not believe in the first place the liberation of minds is needed in Western Europe, nor that all the bourgeois parties will be won in the revolution, it collects masses around it, without inquiring whether they are really communists, without determining its tactics on the supposition that they are, as long as it gets the masses. The left wing wishes in all countries to form parties consisting exclusively of communists and determines its tactics accordingly. Through the example in these originally small parties, the majority of the proletariat, and therefore the masses, will be brought to communism. To the Third International, then, the masses in Europe, Western Europe are a means. 
the left wing dared the aim. Through these tactics, which are quite right in Russia, the Third International employs leader politics. The left wing, on the other hand, employs mass politics. Through these tactics, the Third International is not leading is leading not only the West European, but also the Russian Revolution into ruin. The left wing, on the other hand, through its tactics, leads the world proletariat towards victory. And finally, I will gather my statement into a few theses so that the workers who must strive for themselves to gain clear insight into these tactics must may have them before their eyes in a concise, surveyable form. They have to be read, of course, in the light of the above exposition. 1. The tactics of West European Revolution must be different from those of the Russian Revolution. 2. For here, the proletariat stands alone. 3. Here, the proletariat must make the revolution all by itself against all other classes. 4. The importance of the proletarian masses, therefore, is relatively greater. That of the leader smaller than in Russia. 5. Consequently, here the proletariat must have the very best weapons for the revolution. 6. The trade unions being insufficient weapons, they must be replaced or changed into industrial organizations that are united into one league. 7. As the proletariat must make the revolution all alone without help, it has to rise very high morally as well as spiritually. It is better, therefore, not to use parliamentarism in the revolution. Marx had learned from the Paris Commune the proletariat cannot use or take over the bourgeoisie. Um, I want to take this. Um... And then I'm going to take this, and then I'm going to take State for the Revolution. Thus, the left wing has learned from the Russian, German, Hungarian, from the World Revolution that the proletariat cannot use the old socialist parties nor the trade unions for the revolution. With fraternal greetings, uh, Herman Gorder and stupendously fancy writing. Okay, and that is the end of the text. Um, there's one other thing that I was interested in looking at here. I'm sure entitled The Basis for Communism by Herman Gorder. Where is that? Like the space. Hmm. Herman Gorder. Where is that? <laughs> it's probably some translation error going on. I don't know. Anyway, I hope that everybody enjoyed this. Um, and I will be coming out with a summarization of the text or analysis. And I will probably add an attache either before or after um, it when I upload this. With that said, um, I wanted to thank everybody for coming and let you all go. That's the end of today's session.